Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa. I'm part of the knowledge sharing team at ARENA. I'm really delighted to introduce uh, today's summit on thermal energy storage. Um, today, we have the great pleasure to have an international speaker, Julia. I will introduce her later. Um, and I think also a couple of international attendees, which is great. Um, but I think most of the people joining today are uh, calling from different indigenous lands around Australia. Um, and so I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and pay my respect uh, to elders past and present. Um, I would like to extend that respect also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, potentially joining us today. Also, um, importantly, uh, I would like to thank all of you for, for taking the time to join this virtual summit. Um, the event is being recorded and the recording will be posted um, to the Knowledge Bank in the coming weeks. Um, so you'll definitely be able to go back and watch again your kind of favorite presentations if you like. Um, so why are we all here today? Well, I guess we have kind of different perspectives in the room, but really the key aim of this summit is to understand the opportunities application and also potential commercialization pathways to thermal energy storage solutions, in particular for industrial heat processes. We'll have a scene setting session facilitated by my colleague, Lynn Garrett, who is also part of the knowledge sharing team. And then Dan Starak, who is um, one of the directors of ARENA's business development and transaction team, will facilitate the following sessions, um, which will be focused on understanding the customer needs and some of the technologies that are currently available in the market. We'll then have a final, final, sorry, a final panel discussion. Um, and there will also be some time for questions at the end of each session. So I just invite you to explore the kind of Zoom Q&A session located at the, um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, please feel free to use it um, to send your questions while you hear the presentations. We'll try to get to as many as we can uh, in our Q&A session and in the panel discussion. Um, we also have the upvoting enabled, so you can just give thumbs up to question that you like. Um, and finally, I think before we really dive into the detail of the day, I would like to introduce Rachel Williams, um, the general manager of the project delivery team at Orina, uh, who is going to share some thoughts on, on thermal energy storage and really to kick off the conversation. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I always feel it's terrible to, to use that headshot. It is about 10 years old, and I feel like if I used it in um, on, a, on an internet dating site, I would uh, be done for fraud. Um, but having said that, uh, thank you, Lisa, and welcome. Um, Arena is delighted and privileged to be hosting this summit today on thermal energy storage. Um, it is critical. It is timely. Um, and for Speaking personally, it's really exciting to think about the innovations in storage, both the types of storage. So thinking about thermal storage, moving um, away from kind of lithium iron, um, and also thinking about storage duration, which I think is a really important step. ARENA's purpose is to accelerate the global transition to net zero emissions by supporting pre-commercial technology development in Australia. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about today. ARENA has recently marked its 10 year anniversary. When ARENA was first founded, our role was to increase the amount and the commerciality of renewable energy. And I think if we look around the market in Australia today, um, that's really what's happened. So ARENA's focus has and should have shifted. And now we're really focusing on integrating renewables, both into the electricity system, but also into difficult to abate industries. Storage and particularly long duration storage is a critical element to be able to enable a reliable system powered by renewables. And I think it's also quite topical, uh, given the current cost of gas, um, to look into the opportunities to use thermal storage in the decarbonisation of industrial heat processes. Um, this has the potential to play a key role in the transition to net zero, and ARENA has recently supported renewable processes, uh, renewable process heat projects incorporating thermal storage across applications from hot water through to high temperature alumina calcification. The interplay between electricity, heat and emerging hydrogen, 
hydrogen sectors, uh, the so-called cross-sector coupling, is an area ripe for development, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the speakers today. I think there isn't a bigger or a more important problem that we could be working on. So again, I just want to share with you that I feel incredibly privileged to be here and to be able to learn today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was really a great introduction. Um, I think uh, now um, we are ready to um, kick off uh, with the presentations. Um, I would like then to uh, give it over to, um, to Lim, my colleague in Knowledge Sharing Team, who is going to facilitate the first session. Thank you, Lim. Thanks, Lisa, and indeed Rachel as well um, for those uh, introductions. Uh, so yeah, hello everyone, Lynn Garrett from Marina. Uh, it's an honour to be hosting this first session. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce two extremely knowledgeable individuals from the thermal energy storage space to set the scene for the summit. Uh, it's likely neither of these people need introduction due to the breadth of uh, impact and influence that they've had both in Australia and internationally. Julia Sauder has over 20 years of experience in the energy and environmental sectors and with an intimidating and extensive resume, Julia is now the director of the, oh, sorry, executive director of the Long Duration Energy Storage Council. And second, we'll have Dominic Zahl. Dominic Zahl is the director of the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute or ASTRI, as I'm sure you're all aware and has a long history of experience in renewable technologies and is currently responsible for managing Astri's $100 million investment program for solar thermal. So with that, I'll hand straight to you, Julia, to kick us off with the summit. Uh, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Lynn, so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I hope to be more inspiring than intimidating. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> also, thank you to Lisa and to Lynn and to um, Rachel just for the opportunity to be here. We so greatly appreciate the collaboration and partnership we're doing with all of you. And really look forward to so many more opportunities to speak about laundry sharing storage and thermal storage. So thank you again so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Next slide, thanks. So just want to say hi, I'm Julia Souter, uh, the new executive director of the council. Really excited to be here today and really, really thrilled about the, the gaining momentum about why laundry energy storage is so critical to the global discussions of reading, reaching our net zero targets. Next slide, thanks. So our council was launched at COP26 in November last year. So we've been building on this momentum and we're really thrilled to see the diverse and unique membership that we're pulling together. So not only do we have the technology providers and startups who are working on the different types of laundry energy storage and the diversity that you see with mechanical, chemical, thermal, and electrochemical types of laundry energy storage, you're also seeing customers who are really interested in collaborations with these technology providers, with capital providers, with equipment manufacturers, and integrators and developers all coming together to really start working together to harness the momentum and build a marketplace where we can have this accessibility to provide the amazing diversity of both small scale, large scale laundry sharing storage projects. And I think what we're excited is that this momentum behind the, this diverse group coming together on this global scale to give facts-based information. So sharing all these lessons learned and a lot of data so that we can really inspire and you know, provide societal benefit of decreasing emissions and lowering costs. And we're, and we're really thrilled to kind of see this grow in partnership with many other international organizations to really help spread the message. Next slide. So we're really excited to start honing in on the net zero heat perspectives. And we have launched our flagship report at last COP and now we're building into that report an update on the benchmarking that we did for net zero power. And we're really starting to um, add into that the importance of flexibility with net zero heat. And we're looking at you know, all the different benefits that can be provided to industry applications of, LDA, of LDES um, for chemicals, steel, cement. And today really wanna to focus in on how laundry series storage, net zero heat can really help the decolorization perspective with what we're trying to achieve. And so within 
this entire energy system, we really need to start focusing on flexibility. And so as you move to a world that's more and more dependent on variable renewables, for example, the diurnal cycle of PV generation, you know, certain hours of the day, we're gonna need energy systems that can deal with this variability. So especially in the case of heat, which often has a very um, highly stable demand in industrial processes, um, we need to look at how this is going to be altered with how we need to electrify rapidly. Um, and so we're gonna need to sense some sort of flexibility to deal with this. What's especially important with heat is that it, it's often generated locally and usually by natural gas or coal, which maybe not, might not burden the local system or power system, but in the future, as we start to electrify heat and entire systems, this might add a burden to the already strained transmission distribution grid. And so what we're looking at is that in addition to this flexibility, the heat is about, oh, over about 50% of our final energy consumption. And decarbonizing this will be critical to achieve our climate targets. And it's often been overlooked because it's really complex and more complex than electricity with all kinds of temperatures and different media required for all the various processes. And you'll note on the graph on the right, you'll just kind of see just the range of temperatures that are needed within this and how laundry stream storage can really be applicable. But again, wanna highlight again, this complexity that we're working with and the importance of how we really need to start addressing this with heat. Thanks. And so, when we're looking at this 50% consumption, um, we're also noticing that heat is also still very fossil fuel based with about 70% of heat currently produced by oil, gas, or coal. So as we shift away from these fuel sources um, to use electrified heating, it's already gonna just, you know, again, amplify the need to work with our already strained power production. In addition to that, we have continual climate impacts um, with this urgency, not just for, for climate change, but also for energy security. And we just have price impacts that now are becoming global. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's four different types of laundry sharing storage, so thermal, chemical, electrochemical, mechanical. And so, as we focus today on thermal energy storage, it's really important that we see the integration component and that we're adding flexibility um, when we provide heat. And it's already happening, as I mentioned earlier, from the across heat grades, you know, greater than a thousand degrees Celsius. Um, the diversity, again, how we can use waste heat from existing processes. And we can also store heat for over periods of time ranging from you know, months to, to even years. It all depends on the type of solution chosen. And again, what's exciting is just to see the wide range of options that are available. And so again, highlighting again, the, the flexibility, the diversity and the optimization of what we can do with existing systems. And as we look at three, um, well, one other thing I wanted to highlight too is there, and the, there's three different types of the energy storage. So there's the sensible heat, the latent heat, and thermochemical. And sensible heat is a temperature change. Latent heat is where storage medium changes phases. And thermochemical is where the medium undergoes a reversible chemical reaction. And as you see within each of these categories, there are subcategories. And a lot of our members are working in various areas of these areas of thermal storage. And so what we're, we're thrilled to see is that within these broad categories, you can see concrete, silica, and sensible storage. You see fatty acids with liquids. Um, but again, even though with all this diversity, it's only less, it's less than 1% of the energy storage is used as thermal. So there's an enormous opportunity here to expand and really provide the, the benefit um, to really help this diverse technology landscape. So in our work, we have been um, working with various providers of thermal energy storage and to really kind of open up the awareness of how we can meet heat demands. And what's been really exciting to me is that not only do we have a wide range of options available, um, but that there are high temperature and low temperature hot water solutions that can provide heat of, of greater than 2000 degrees Celsius and that you can store it for years. I think that duration that, that Rachel highlighted earlier is so key because this is, is we need to have you know, that, that range of what is available to us. So again, knowing that we have thermal energy storage that can provide again, this, this duration of time um, with such powerful um, like reservoirs of, of storage is really, is really critical. So we're really excited to see again, this 
the, the duration, the discharge temperatures, um, just how we can really influence a diverse group of technology storage cases. And in particular, which really we want to highlight is that this is something that hasn't, you know, is, is a way in the future. It's happening now. So thermal energy storage is already deployed um, with large industrial players. You'll see two examples here from various members. Energy Nest is collaborating with Yara and providing stability to a 400 degree system that's a fertilizer plant in Norway. And another one is Bren Miller Energy, and they're optimizing the use of heat in a CCGT plant um, with Enel, an Italian utility. So with our membership, we've really wanted to hone in on the data and the fact-based information. So as part of our net zero heat work with the council, we develop a, a thermal storage benchmarking with our members and spend a lot of time and really, pre again, appreciate just all the data sharing and the collaboration of exploring these five different types of heat outputs to align the existing heat grades with better use today in the industry. And in our benchmarking, we examine the round trip cost. Uh, so charging based on resistive heating, storage and discharging. And most of the solutions have a 90% round trip efficiency, making them one of the most efficient storing mechanisms out there. For reference, <laughs> most power storage systems have a 60 to 80% round trip efficiency. In addition to the benefits that you see with just the efficiency that's, that's provided, the total cost when analyzed as levelized cost of heat is also very low. Uh, with the local price being about 75 US dollars or 75 percent of the cost in storage when you're looking at only adding anywhere from four to eight dollars uh, megawatt hour stored. So it's really exciting to see that there's just not much additive cost when you're looking at the value out of thermal energy storage. And so one of the reasons for this low cost is the storage media that's being used is highly abundant materials like concrete, silica, or salts. So in addition to, to promoting that there are already existing projects out there, we wanted to take some business cases. And you'll see much more of this in the November report. This is one of the many examples that we'll be providing. But we wanted to see how it could impact an industrial setting. So we looked at it, um, exploring aluminum refining. And we're a process that requires significant amount of heat and a very stable load. So with our industry partners and our members, we developed a um, fictitious refinery um, representing many around the world. And we wanted to show that within this process, we ex wanted to explore how thermal storage could be implemented to provide steam for the refining at about 300 degrees Celsius and around 100 degree bar. And as we're doing that, we're looking at costs, impacts with customer ESG, regulations, public policy, public pressures, to really get that full perspective of how we can amplify the message of thermal energy storage being really critical to our, our industry. And what we saw in this business case is that thermal storage, when based about on renewables for $25 kilowatt hour, can be the most cost competitive and decolorization option at the moment. When you compare it to biomass, which is also available in limited qualities, hydrogen at about $200 kilogram, and electric heating with storing electrons of a battery. It's also cost competitive with natural gas when a carbon tax is in place, up to $100 carbon, carbon cost, when gas prices rise. So we're assuming them here at $19 megawatt hour at this example. So again, what's exciting is that you're seeing that when you're looking at decarbonization for thermal storage, it can be one of the least expensive options across many of those solutions that are available today. So it's been a great opportunity to be here with you all today to really you know, be part of the discussion. I really look forward to the questions and dialogue. There are many ways that you can partner with the council. These three graphs represent the current three reports that are on our website. The first is just showing that the market potential for long duration storage conservatively is looking at $3 trillion globally. We're looking at as, as this industry expands and, and provides the flexibility to the entire energy system economy that we're providing various tools to help implement to make this happen. So you have the 24 seven clean PPAs where you're decreasing emissions and costs. We have renewables integrating. And then also just creating policy awareness with various options to adapt and mold into, into various countries and, and local communities. And so one of those policy options would be a 24 seven clean PPA where you have every hour of every day, of every month of every year with clean energy because you have laundry storage backing up the grid. So 
I'm really excited to see that we have both the power and heat coming together, this emphasis on thermal energy storage today, because it is, as I mentioned earlier, so critical to decarbonizing our future. We need the, the urgency is now. And then if you'd like to reach out to us, we'd be more than happy to talk more about the council. But again, thank you so much, Tarina, for the partnership. We look forward to many more collaborations and more discussion on such an exciting topic as long duration energy storage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. That was an exceptional introduction to the summit. Um, yeah, it's great to hear some of those um, US and also indeed global perspectives, I guess, while you know, our energy systems are quite different. The process heat storage duration and firming needs of uh, energy systems the world over will be seminal in uh, all of us achieving decarbonization. Uh, and indeed, a lot of those that you mentioned, you know, it's, it's really exciting to see that diversity of technologies and end use applications represented by the group uh, here today. So with that, I'll pass to you, Dominic. who may, like all of us, uh, be <laughs> managing the technology. Uh, so just bear with us a moment. Hi, Dominic, are you there? Um, you just let me know I'm in, but <laughs> we can't hear you, Dominic. Maybe, um, Lim, uh, if you do don't, don't mind, while we wait for Dominic to set it up, um, I, I believe one attendee has one, one question probably. I can see Ruby has his end up. Um, so maybe if you're happy with it, we can just ask him whether he wants to ask his question. Yeah, certainly. Uh, please fire away. Uh... I actually can't see that question from my side, Lisa. So perhaps if you could uh, read it out if they're unable to do so themselves and we yeah. might throw to Julia on that one. Yeah, I think you just raised his hand. Ravi, would you like to type in your question in the Q&A box? It, it could just be uh, operator I error. I, I, yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah, I think it's operator error, unfortunately. Uh, so Dom's an attendee, not a panelist, Lisa. Is that something we can change quickly? Um, if not, we can always uh, move towards the next panelist. Um, just yeah, I can definitely sure change that. Um, yeah, great. Thanks all. Apologies. Uh, you know, not the first time this has happened for us all, I guess. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, got yes, you. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I've now become a panelist. Thank you. Brilliant. Great. Thank you. So over to you. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. Would you like to share the presentation? Oh, you can just run it. That's great. So, look, apologies for that. Um, um, look, firstly, my name is Dominic Sahl. I'm the director of the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute. Um, we sit within CSIRO. Um, we've actually been funded by ARENA um, um, over a 10-year period, so set up in uh, set back up in about 2012. And, and our real job in ARENA is to facilitate commercial uptake of solar thermal um, technologies and systems. So really happy today to talk to you about what we do as an organisation in the renewable heat space. Next slide, thanks, Lisa. So, so the, the first question is why, um, you know, why, why are we doing this? Why renewable heat? Um, so, you know, a lot of the focus has been on the electricity sector, but um, when you look at um, data that comes from the, the, depart the old Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, but also look at some, some modelling done by Reputic, who did the, um, the, the current government's um, um, analysis for their, um, uh, for their energy policies, um, you'll see that um, emissions from electric generation um, will actually drop below those from industrial emissions. So that's when you look at stationary and industrial processes. So emissions are going up. In, in the industrial sector and, 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 and so we need to address those. Next slide. So um, when it comes to renewable heat, I always say to people temperature matters. Um, so you can break you know, the, 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 the market down in Australia um, in terms of temperature um, and the temperature will often dictate the solution. So most people think that most of the money is spent in the over 500 degree, but, but in fact, most of the money spent on industrial process heat in Australia is in that 150 to 500 degree range. Um, it's over 50% um, of, um, 
or, or of about 50% is spent in that in temperature range. I also note that less than 5% of renewable heat is provided through electricity, but, but that's going to change with rising gas, with rising gas prices. Um, um, you know, there are renewable heat options that are now um, quite commercially viable, um, at, particularly at the lower temperatures and increasingly viable at these sort of mid-range temperatures. Next slide, thanks, Lisa. So, so for, for ASTRI, renewable heat, um, we, we focus on the capture, storage and utilisation of renewable heat. Um, even though I'm a solar thermal person, ASTRI is agnostic about how that renewable heat is generated. It could be CST, it could be electricity, bioenergy, geothermal, waste heat sources, could be hydrogen, other renewable fuels, or it could be a combination of these. Um, we're agnostic because um, we believe that what the client wants is a renewable heat solution. And we think that their particular circumstances, their location, the way they operate should dictate how you actually deliver that solution. Um, so we, we don't try to pick winners in advance. We try to help the client and work with the client. So, so we're driven by the customer's needs, not technology interests. And we really are trying to deliver an energy solution to the customer, not a technology solution. So often it's an integration of different technologies and that's what Astri tries to focus on. Um, we also look at sectors. Uh, we also try to understand how renewable heat plays a role in mining mineral processing. Of course, utility scale power generation, industrial process heat, renewable fuels, and increasingly agriculture. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so thermal energy storage, I've talked about renewable heat, but thermal energy storage is a critical enabler. So you, you really need this to, to allow you to be smart about how you use your energy and, and, and when you use your energy. So, so basically storage allows you to capture the heat and to use it when and how you want to use it or when you require it. You can displace gas or electricity at night. Um, you know, it allows you to actually capture heat when renewable resources are cheap or plentiful. Um, the front end charging um, for thermal energy storage can be multiple pathways, as I just said, it's agnostic as to how you provide that heat for storage, um, can store at temperatures much higher than the target industrial process. And I think this is a really important point that most of the clients we work with, their process might only be 150, but we try to store it at five, six, 700 degrees. Um, the thinking being that we can displace more gas and, and energy by the higher, higher the storage and you also reduce your storage costs because you've got more, more energy in a smaller location. Um, these things can also simultaneously charge and discharge which some other um, energy storage technologies can't. And again, when you're dealing with steam, for instance, it's really easy just to integrate it within your existing process. Thanks, Lisa. Um, as I said, uh, we focus Astri on the 150 to 600. Um, why, um, you know, larger clients, higher energy costs, solutions, that, you know, the, the customers want solutions now. Focus on gas displacement, um, and you know, and and what we really try to do is give them information and options for decision support. So we help them to understand what their options are. But but again, in this temperature range, it's not the technology that's the problem. The technology exists; it's the integration. So it's really how you manage operational integration risks at this temperature. Um, and again, it's it's just uh, it's it's a very interesting space, and there's not many people providing that advice in that sort of higher temperature space. Next slide, thanks. Um, in terms of the options, I, I'll, I, I'm not going to spend much time on these other than to say that when it comes to renewable heat and TES, um, you're, you're blessed with options. So you can put you know, renewable power into TES that can come from PV or wind. Um, and so that's one option. You can also look at mirrors, um, concentrated sort of thermal into TES, waste heat. If you've got a waste heat source, you can also put that into thermal energy storage. Next slide. Thanks, Lisa. Um, electric ball is another option. Um, a lot of our clients jump immediate electric boilers. We, we do advise them to say, just think about time of use pricing. Um, if, if firm renewables gets more expensive at night and you're beholden to the price of electricity when you need to use it and you do operate at night, then electric boilers are a great option, but you, you just need to be careful about, about not getting caught up in, in higher prices overnight. Of course, renewable fuels are also a really um, good option. Um, if you get access to hydrogen, um, for instance, or other, other renewable fuels that can also provide you with renewable heat. And of course, um, the, 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 the you know, bioenergy and biomass is a really great option also for renewable heat if you've got access to a feedstock and, and, and resources. Almost finished. So, so often clients say to us, which solution is best? So when it comes to renewable heat, TES, which is the best option? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, off, it, it, there's no easy answer. It really depends on a whole bunch of factors. So do you have on-site or adjacent land, um, you know, you know, the reason we say that is because on-site land with good DNI, you can put a, a direct collector on, but if you don't have on-site land or adjacent land, then you have to think about inputting your energy. Um, you know, 
Do you have land potentially reasonably close by, aye, one or two kilometres where you can put a behind the meter solution in? What are your resources? How much solar, wind, bioenergy, waste streams do you have? So you need to look at that. What's your operating regime? If you have nighttime operations, you want a different solution than if you just have daytime operations. What is your heating cooling load? Because it's, it's all about the energy solution and you need to get the right balance of heating, cooling, and what does that mean? You know, what weight heat sources do you use? A lot of companies we work with, there's a lot of heat going out the stack. So we, we try to understand how you can manage that. Um, what are your projected energy costs? If, you're, if, you, if you've got a long-term 20-year contract for gas at $6 a gigajoule, you don't want to come talking to us unless you've got really key policies around sustainability. Um, and, and that's another key issue for us. What, 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 what does the corporation think about decarbonisation sustainability? What's the strategy? And also, what's your risk appetite you know, and, 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 and for companies? And so all of those things go into the decision, um, which is why it's so challenging, but also very interesting. It's a great space to be in. We're working with a, 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 a number of very large companies who are really keen to work with us to understand how you can decarbonise. And, and it's a great space to be in. Um, you know, you, you're actually helping customers to, to drive those options, which is good. And, and that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dominic. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and I agree. I mean, the, the increased interest and rapidity required for gas displacement is certainly a growing and, you know, interesting space to watch. And also, you know, like Julia, thanks for touching on the diversity of TES resources and applications that we're really starting to see come into the market. Uh, I don't have any questions in the Q&A currently, um, so I'd, I'd just like to remind everyone on the call that you're welcome to put questions into the Q&A at any stage, uh, and we will do our best to address those uh, in the panel discussions at the end of each session. Uh, so in lieu of any of those, I might ask you one myself, um, and, and I'd, I'd really open this to both you, Dominic, and Julia. Um, so rather than seeing TES, I, I guess, as we may have done in the past as a competitor to other storage solutions, you know, such as lithium ion and hydrogen, do you have any views on how these technologies could really uh, fit together and work a bit more effectively in symbiosis? They, I, it, seems like there's been a bit of an attitude of this or something else. Uh, and obviously diversity in the energy mix is going to be key to energy security moving forward, particularly through a period of rapid transition. So I might throw that to you first, Dominic, but open to both of you. So um, thanks for that. Um, so, so, so at large scale, power generation scale, I know this is a little bit more around thermal energy storage, but a large scale thermal energy storage, all the evidence around the world suggests that integrating PV and batteries with CSP as a technology gives you the lowest aggregate cost of energy to the system. So that's what the Chinese are doing, that's what the Spanish have done, that's what the uh, has, Chile has done, South Africa, um, all of these countries in the Middle East, they've integrated PV with CSP and PV with some batteries, the thinking being that no one's gonna beat PV for energy cost during the day. It is the cheapest dominant technology, and so and and, and it will give you the lowest cost. Batteries help you to, to to balance some of that out, but for nighttime energy solutions, you need something that's firm. And um and and technologies like pumped hydro and CSP um sort of give you that sort of so it's getting that balance right. Same for um our, our, the work we do with um our industrial clients on renewable heat. We don't ever offer a single solution. Um, we always offer an integrated solution. It's not about replacing gas, it's about displacing gas. So we try to integrate with an existing gas system. The clients we work with, particularly those who are gonna import electricity, will put batteries in there as well to help manage loads. So, so we think an integrated solution is the, is the most cost-effective way to get you to an 80, 90, 100% decarbonisation outcome. And, and we would always recommend that. We, we, we think that you've gotta pick the right technologies for the right location at the right time of day to deliver the right um, decarbonisation outcome. And so we would ever, you know, I'd love to say CSP is the answer, but it's not. CSP is just a part of the mix um, and, um, and you need to integrate solutions to do that. Yeah, great. And, and maybe before we do go on um, to you, Julia, what, what do you think? I mean, there, there seems to have been a bit of a barrier to CSP uptake in Australia. Uh, what do you think the barriers have been to that? Because it, it really is integrating quite effectively and rapidly across the world, as, as you've just noted. Um, look, it's, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things in Australia, um, you know, in, in most of the other countries, CSP required um, government um, intervention or subsidies to get it going. It's a very high upfront cattle cost. 
Um, it, it's ideal sweet spot is sort of that 12 to 15 hours. People think it's less than that, but really the, the evidence around the world is suggesting that 12 to 15 hours is the sweet spot for CSP. It really is a nighttime generator, but no one at the moment needs in Australia 12 to 15 hours of you know, firm fixed capacity. The capacity market mechanism will, will help to get people to think about this. I know the AEMO and the ISP people are thinking about this. There is a CSP robot that's thinking about this issue. But, but it, there's, no, there's no easy solution here. It is, a, it is an expensive technology initially, high upfront capex, and you've got to get it going to show what people can do. So even when people say I'm prepared to pay, then they, oh, but will it work and what's happening? So it's just a, it's just a case of finding that right niche. And, um, and, you know, and, and it is 12 hours. And at the moment in Australia with coal and gas turning away, there's no market yet. Even in the, even in the PV battery market, I mean, I keep on saying to people that 80% of the money made from PV and batteries is in the FCAS market which tells you that there isn't yet a market for, for, for stored energy for in, the, in terms of pure energy market. Sure. Thanks, Dom. Um, Julia, any thoughts? I guess there's a huge amount sure. to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice to see you, Dominic. And, and, and great answer. I, on, on the first question, I would just build on what, what Dominic said. I mean, he's, he, all the points he made are spot on and the, the location specific is, is so critical. And we're really kind of trying to push the hybrid nature because you just get more optionality. I think what's also really important is that the kind of trifecta about the, the urgency, the cost decreasing, and then the fact that you have all these options now and that thermal storage is just still less than 1% of the entire energy storage market. So I think making that marketplace, you can see the diversity of technologies, you can see how the solids, the liquid, the liquid and gas attributes can kind of help you and, and your customers kind of have this, this benefit. But I think it's the education awareness, making people sure that they see that these options are there, they're real, they're working today, and they're bringing down costs and providing enormous environmental benefit. And, and just to add, I, I don't want to, like people say it's only 1% of the market, but the reality is that 70% of all energy produced in the world at the moment is through thermal processes. So coal and gas is just a thermal process. It's it's it, you, you, the storage is in the pipe or in the in the lump of coal you've got out the plant. It's a thermal process. Things like CSP is basically a coal-fired power plant, but instead of using coal, you use energy from the sun. And you know, so so we need to be careful about here. We're not reinventing the wheel. You know, I had a I had a discussion with a senior departmental person the other uh, last year about oh, but thermal energy storage. And I'm going to Jeff hot shower this morning. You know, like I'm, it's not it's not rocket science. Thermal storage has been around for a long time. It's just getting people to think about it through a renewable lens, um, and and that's the challenge. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. And as we you know increasingly uh, focus on matters like ESG and just transition, the the growing market really provides opportunities for those in thermal technologies to transfer their skill sets across. And I think that's a really valuable part of the conversation that should be shared as well. Um, any closing remarks from either of you? Because if not, we're a couple of mid minutes ahead of schedule uh, and we might forge on to allow some uh, space for technical difficulties later in uh, the webinar um, and also uh, further conversation. So uh, open to either of you for closing remarks. Um, all I can say is that the technologies exist. I mean, you know, for industry, if it's under 100 degrees, you know, you're crazy not to speak to Jared and his team about heat pumps and other, you know, microwave inverters. Like the technologies exist and they're proven and they're commercial at the lower temperature. Higher temperature is challenging, um, but, but all the technologies exist. It's just how you integrate them and how you get them at the right price point. So we're not, we're not talking about reinventing the wheel here. They all exist. It's just about how you integrate them. And, and just to reiterate that point, Thanks, Dominic. And I would just add that the, um, and, and build on what he said about, you know, the, the diversity of options that's already available today and what's coming down, and the, you know, through the marketplace. And that what's going to be really exciting is showing these diverse business cases that we'll be promoting in our, in our November report, just seeing how in ag and refinery and fertilizer, you have the optionality to have thermal energy storage provide this value add that I think once we really brought in the awareness, it's really powerful. So we're really excited to, to have more input and dialogue and look forward to your comments and questions on on this updated benchmarking that you'll be seeing in a few months. Great, thank you both. Uh, I think you have very comprehensively and effectively set the scene for the rest of the summit. Uh, and I'm very interested to see what uh, all of the members presenting today uh, have to say off the back of that.
Uh, so with that, I will pass to Dan Sturrock, who is a, another of my ARENA colleagues. He works in our business development team. Uh, so over to you, Dan, for session two, which is around understanding the customer's needs. Thanks, Lynn. Um, good to be here. I had my own technical difficulties joining earlier, so I can sympathise with others. Um, but uh, it's a really, really interesting uh, discussion and important to ARENA, as, as others have been saying very complex as Don was saying. So um, in the second section, we're gonna get the customer perspective, which uh, you know, I think uh, talks to that sort of complexity and the decisions that have to be made. And we've got three great speakers uh, who are all well known to Arena. Um, so um, first of all, we've got um, Jared Leake from A2EP, um, who, who I think people probably know quite well. Uh, Jared's been uh, close to the action here for, for a long time, CEO of A2EP, done a lot of work for Arena. And so um, without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Jared to take you, uh, take you all through, uh, I guess, some of his perspectives um, and some of the work that they've been doing in this space for a range of customers. Many thanks, Dan, if I'll jump straight into the uh, the presentation there. Uh, and just for those that don't know, A2EP, we're a, a, a member-funded organisation. Here's our list of, of fabulous members right here, and that's who's bringing this uh, uh, webinar and presentation to you today. And uh, a few familiar logos there as well that are also working with uh, LDES, uh, the likes of Vazelio and GTED. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll just give you a bit of a background of what we've been working on, and looks like the... Uh, the headline there from up the top there hasn't come across as we, we migrated, but still, I think we'll be able to get through this. Um, our, our background is really what with uh, start off with the studies from, from Arena there uh, and that top one there, about 20 uh, pre-feasibility studies and seven feasibility studies really was looking at temperature ranges sort of below 100 degrees. And that, that meant a lot of those studies were in food and beverage, but also there was a few industrial ones in there as well. And that's what really kicked our, our knowledge bank off here a couple of years ago and, and uh, really some, some really good learnings in that uh, today. And we'll try and distill that into how that affects the uh, TAS uh, today. Uh, since then, we've been doing work with New South Wales government and, and some other areas as well. Uh, with Race for 2030 CRC, we've done some modelling for the feds on the overall potential for uh, heat pumps across Australia, uh, commercial, resi and industrial. Um, and just kicking off just now, we're, we're about to do a study with the Hydrogen Council on this, uh, some higher temperatures on, on how hydrogen and bioenergy, uh, we don't want to just want to look at one, um, is going to be uh, useful in the pathways there for, uh, for that higher temperature heating. So if you look at the uh, the next slide there, um, so this this is uh, just that, that com really common problem, especially in the commercial space where you've got that heat demand earlier in the day and that peak there, uh, and then that uh, um, uh, fading off through the day. And uh, what do you know, beautifully, it doesn't match uh, solar PV output. Uh, I think I've only found one, one heat demand that does that, and that was uh, in sometimes in a meat works uh, um, that, that may match solar PV, but virtually there's not many uh, heat demands would match that uh, solar PV output. Um, so there, if you still look at what something you can do in green in, in terms of uh, minimizing that peak and, and spreading that uh, energy demand over during the solar, uh, this is where the uh, thermal energy storage works so well. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll, uh, let's break it down into really what it does. And, and the, the key thing is, is in the middle there, uh, shrink, shift, shift, shift. And, and that's what we saw with a lot of these feasibility studies coming in when we looked at the impact of, uh, of it, when you could employ thermal energy storage and when you couldn't, it really did have a big impact on, on the return on investment and the, the economic scenarios. Uh, but first of all, when you say shrink, uh, these uh, heat pumps are, are much more expensive than your incumbent heating options, somewhere between five and 10 times when you look at just versus a standard boiler or burner. Um, so what the heat pump can, can do, you, uh, or sorry, the thermal storage can do is, is really shrink the size of that heat pump by, by evening it out and, and looking at more delivering on an average load rather than that peak load. Uh, and that can, can really uh, deliver a good returns and reduction in the capex, somewhere between at least 10, but up to 30% reduction in the capex for that heat pump. So all of a sudden you're not looking at five or 10 times the, the capital cost, it might be down to sort of three or four times. Um, the other key one there, I put that, I have highlighted that, is that you avoid these electrical upgrade costs. We did see in quite a few uh, studies where the electrical upgrade cost was uh, equivalent or a multiple 
of the actual heat pump project itself. So if you can avoid that, that's that's an absolute major one. And I think we'll see that happening more and more when we look at commercial buildings and things like that as well. Um, in terms of shifting, uh, these ones are fairly obvious, just shifting to a low tariff times, uh, shifting to, to uh, utilize more solar PV, and finally shifting to use uh, to operate in times of higher ambient temperatures, a little bit more relevant for commercial, in fact, residential is there as well, uh, getting away from those times where it's at five or 10 degree ambient temperature, because you do see a big drop off in performance for heat pumps around then when you start getting to that range where icing up of, of condensers starts happening. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few comments on the right there about how that impacts the uh, uh, the, the savings and the potential, uh, but really it's uh, it's that capex and the, and the reduction of that electrical upgrades we think uh, has the, the biggest impact there. If you look at the uh, next slide, just a rough example of, of what we saw. Um, and, and this is one of those examples where you've got that peak in the green line there uh, um, and that peak in the early morning, but you can average that out using your, your thermal energy storage. And, 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 and there you go, there's, there's a good couple hundred thousand dollars worth of savings uh, right there. Uh, if you had to do electrical upgrades, it's much more than a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of savings typically. Um, you may choose to, to narrow that even further, that operating range uh, and, and shift that to the middle of the day to use solar PV in which case the savings are not so much on capex but more on the opex but uh, either way uh, a match made in heaven with uh, thermal energy storage on the uh, next slide we did look at a few uh, different uh, load profiles and this is where, where, where it's so important to understand what that profile looks like um, so you can you can reduce the size of that peak demand um, so yeah, on the left, there, there's a typical daily profile, maybe for a, 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 a dairy farm or a, an abattoir, which does some washing early in the morning and then a wash down early in the afternoon. And you've got those peaks and you say, well, we can shift those to, to a lower tower of time and, and really applicable when you've got those interday peaks. If you've got a weekly peak, like a contract manufacturing case we saw, it's a little bit more questionable. If you just got the one weekly peak, you know, unlikely that, that the thermal storage is going to really help you a lot. Um, if you've got a couple of peaks, it starts, it does change. So I'll put a question mark on that one. Certainly when it doesn't work, uh, and we saw in the cases for heat pumps, is if you've got a seasonal peak, if you're drying fruit for a couple of months of the year, uh, a heat pump is really quite uneconomical and the thermal storage, uh, not, not one to help there either. Uh, so just go to the next slide, and this is a, a case, uh, and this is uh, one of the studies that uh, was happened is now going through to uh, to operation. Uh, it's being commissioned there in, in October this year, and this is for the um, uh, Three Ravens Brewery down in Melbourne, and they'll be employing a, a very interesting heat pump operation where they'll be storing both heat and cold. Uh, so the, the heat pump from, from NX, uh, only a small one, only about sort of 40 odd kilowatts, uh, but it'll be able to produce the hot water they need to, 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 for the process. Um, and also the chill, the cold water they need for uh, when they're chilling down before, uh, before fermentation as well. Um, there's an animation coming out there. They also utilize at certain times of the year, um, they'll have that excess heat and they can also use this for some space heating uh, within the brewery as well. Uh, and if they've got too much heat, they dump that to the gas cooler. It, it, there is another case as well with uh, um, Hardwick's uh, Meatworks there uh, north of uh, Melbourne are also going ahead with a heat pump project and they'll be employing uh, the uh, the waste heat from the refrigeration plant to tie in with that one a little probably a little bit of, of thermal storage there just to create a buffer but the real thermal storage for them is going to be with the hot water that they generate uh, from the uh, from the heat pump there and that'll be storing that for the process and and with the, that hot water tank uh, they'll be able to shift and move that around and, and, and really have some good process flexibility. So they'll appreciate that one there. Um, that's about uh, most of what we've seen over, over the last few years. Uh, plenty of other info and findings and reports and case studies. If you go to futureheat.info, we've got uh, a mass of, of webinar recordings and tools and bits and pieces there. So uh, that's that's uh, the most of what we know and what we've learned in the, in the thermal energy storage. And I uh, hope that helps. Right, back to you, Dan. Thanks very much, Jared, for that for that uh, flyover there, and uh, we'll get straight into the next speaker. We've got Thomas Mack from Rio up next, and Thomas has been working with uh, Arena on a, on a couple of projects, and um, someone that we've bumped into on various uh, uh, topics around decarbonisation of heavy industry. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, Thomas sharing his perspective on some of the things that Rio are looking at um, across their businesses, and I think particularly. 
on uh, the aluminium side. Over to you, Thomas. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to present today. Um, I wanted to take us through our um, uh, some of our thoughts and investigations that we're doing uh, internally on, on thermal energy storage opportunities and challenges. And maybe we can just go to the slide number two. <laughs> Uh, Rio Tinto's ambition is really to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And you can see at a high level that our operations, which are based uh, around the globe, uh, effectively have emissions in four key categories. Um, first and foremost, our emissions are mainly produced by electricity. You can see we've got about 14 million tonnes of emissions there. Anodes and reductants at 6.4 million tonnes. Process heat comes in number three at 5.6 and finally mobile diesel at 4 million tonnes. And so when we have a look at the way that we use energy and the way that our emissions are generated, really we're focused on process heat as one of our core activities and core uh, path forwards to achieving our net zero emissions. And we see thermal energy storage systems as being integral in answering particularly that process heat challenge that we have. Maybe if we move to the next slide, when we have a look at um, building supply chains uh, for net zero, we're really looking at an energy transition in order to um, get our assets uh, to a net zero position. And really that starts off with building out renewable energy sources. Uh, intermittent um, energy generation, such as solar and wind, then needs to be firmed with energy storage for intermittency. And really that's where we're seeing the thermal energy storage being completely integral into that energy supply chain. Where we have thermal energy needs that we, as, as mentioned previously, that start to be in that very high temperature category, um, we may consider using TES with non-electric energy conversion. So things such as hydrogen that can supply temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees. And all of that then needs to be retrofitted into our site, needs to be sequenced and scheduled in our net zero pathways program. And all of those elements then need to work uh, together to form some of our net zero products. And so we're seeing thermal energy storage systems as being completely integral, either as a thermal storage or as that non-electric conversion to then provide thermal energy. If we move to slide four and focusing a little bit more detail on our process heat challenges, you can see the 5.6 million tonnes of emissions uh, aluminium is by far the largest contributor at 4.9 million. And that's really our alumina refineries that we've been focused on, predominantly in Gladstone, where we have two alumina refineries um, called both Yawan and QAL. And they use uh, thermal heat in terms of both steam generation as well as calcination technologies. Uh, minerals comes in second, and really that's within our, um, within our boron operations and then some smaller elements throughout iron ore and copper as well. And so we're really focused on steam raising. And obviously steam can be raised with renewables directly, <clears throat> but those renewables aren't able to um, operate 24 seven, whereas our operations need that. And so we're really looking at thermal energy systems um, to be able to bridge that gap um, between uh, daylight hours when we're able to use renewables to generate electricity and nighttime where it needs to be firmed. We're also looking at combustion fuel uh, for our calciners, having a look at how we can retrofit different opportunities into our existing calcination uh, requirements. And finally, around operability, um, understanding that our operations are base load, how can we integrate thermal energy systems into existing operations? How can we integrate them into um, uh, intermittent renewables as well? Um, slide number five, um, then really begins to look across the Rio Tinto portfolio. And you can see there on the left-hand side, um, we have a graph of our various assets. And I've highlighted in, in the yellow circles where some of the assets sit on our energy consumption curve in terms of long-duration energy storage, and in particular, where thermal uh, energy storage applications um, are suitable. And you can see that there are two distinct zones within our operations, one that needs a very high capacity and a very high power output. And then there's a medium scale capacity and power output that's required as well. But going through those, um, having a look at the power requirements 
first and foremost on a large scale for our alumina refineries, for example, you can see that we need about 850 to 1,000 megawatts of base load energy and base load thermal heat uh, for some of our operations, uh, particularly those alumina refineries in Gladstone that I mentioned. Minerals processing, such as boron, needs between 100 to 150 megawatts of thermal heat as well. If we're then having a look at how long we need to store that energy for, we're principally focused just on a 24-hour cycle at the moment, so that daytime, nighttime cycle, and what kind of firming do we need to have there? And if we have a look at that, we need about 9,000 megawatt hours of thermal storage um, for our alumina refineries, 1,500 megawatts um, for some of our mineral processing. And if we think about the temperature range, we're really talking at the top end of, of steam requirements more than 300 degrees of heat and between 50 to 100 atmospheres for steam, again for our alumina refineries, and slightly less, uh, less than 200 degrees and 10 atmospheres for some of the medium uh, temperature requirements that we have in minerals processing. And finally, calcination. Um, it accounts for about a third of our um, overall process heat requirements, and that needs um, very hot air um, to calcine some of our materials in excess of 900 degrees. So we're looking at storage hours of between 9 to 15 hours um, and very hot, um, very large-scale storage requirement. And I thought to end on a case study, uh, so that would be slide six. We're looking at all sorts of different technologies and we're really open to, to different technology types. We certainly haven't landed on any one specific technology, but we are landing on a concept, and that would be that we would take renewable energy um, effectively use some type of a heating element to store energy in the thermal mass. Now, this works for concentrating solar thermal, it works for a heating element, but effectively providing heat energy as thermal energy to a thermal mass. Again, that can be hot concrete, hot sand, hot rocks, um, even molten salt systems to store that thermal uh, energy. And then finally, when we need to generate steam from that thermal mass, we would then again pass air over the thermal mass um, to generate steam via a piece of technology like a HRSG, a heat recovery steam generator, to then produce that um, thermal load that our refineries or some of our other operations need. So they're the type of technologies that we're looking at and interested in. We're also open to other um, applications as well. And when we think about what we um, need to do in order to commercialise these technologies at a very large industrial scale, probably at a world's largest scale, we think about the levelised cost of energy storage. And so there are some key, I guess, some um, uh, factors that we're looking at, and we're looking at how we can um, work in with different proponents of energy storage, how we can develop uh, technologies so that the initial capital investment is suitable for the um, uh, for the for the requirements that we have, to look at operating and maintenance costs to try to bring them down, um, to look at power costs. Ultimately, it does come down to the electrons that you can supply the system to generate that heat. And finally, in terms of the energy output, what kind of a response does the system have to allow our operations to sustain base load operations? So those are some of the challenges that we have. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities. We see a lot of partnership opportunities as well with um, uh, providers of these thermal storage systems. And uh, we're looking forward to developing them over the coming years and uh, achieving our target and ambition of net zero by 2050. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Thomas. And, uh... As you know, here at Arena, we're, we're all about helping all companies uh, achieve their targets and like to uh, bring those forward by maybe a decade, if that's okay with, with you. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep working away. But um, uh, the next speaker to share a, a, a probably a different perspective, given the nature of Mars, is Paul Matushka. And um, Paul's been at Mars for a long time, so obviously knows the organisation well and is... Uh, working on uh, decarbonising process heat uh, across the Mars business in Australia. So I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Dan. Uh, yeah, as, as introduced, my name is Paul Matushka and I work for uh, Mars Pet Care here in Australia. Um, I'm based in Wodonga as part of the wet pet food manufacturer. Um, 
And over the past two to three years, we have been on a, on a steep learning curve of how to use renewable energy for uh, thermal heat. Uh, learning with and from many, uh, including ARENA, A2EP, ASTRI and Graphite Energy uh, that are part of the uh, forum today. And you know, we wouldn't be positioned where we are today without that type of collaborative approach. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so Mars Incorporated is a, um, a privately owned global FMCG company owned by the Mars family. Uh, the family has a net worth exceeding 100 billion US and sustainability is the key priority at at board level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our business is, is the vehicle to deliver the family sustainability agenda, to lead and demonstrate that a sustainable, a sustainable future is not only possible, but viable. Uh, sustainability is a touch point for all business decisions and backed by a $1 billion commitment. And you know, sustainability isn't just climate uh, action, um, although that is a key area of focus. So next, uh, next slide, please. So why is thermal energy important for Mars? Uh, fundamentally, Mars Incorporated has a target to be net zero by 2040 within direct operations. In Australia, we've solved this for electricity which is 62% of our carbon energy footprint, but only 25% of our total energy. Switching to renewable electricity was the easy problem to solve. Natural gas remains the challenge, which is difficult to partially offset, let alone at 100%. So whatever the, the, the source of renewable energy, it will only be available, it, it will not be available, sorry, um, 24, 24 seven at the consistency or quantity required by our manufacturing plants. The sun only shines when it shines and the wind only blows when it blows, etc. Generation and demand will not match every minute, every hour, every day, every month. We use natural gas for thermal energy, uh, predominantly as steam. Steam is very expensive to move. Uh, you know, for about one kilometer, it's somewhere between uh, one and two million dollars capital costs. So generation of, of, of heat is needed on site. Thermal energy storage is the vehicle to mitigate expensive thermal transport and mitigate oversizing investment into the generations uh, source of re renewable energy. The storage maximizes fossil fuel displacement, all of which are critical to the Mars operating philosophy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an indicative work example for a project we are scoping at the Wodonga site using concentrated solar thermal as the energy source. The TES size has been optimised based on capital costs versus natural gas displacement related to our operational demand pattern, which is unique for each site, each location, and when the project is deployed. When we include thermal energy storage, we have shown we could displace approximately 67 terajoules of any energy annually, and without, we only displace around 43 terajoules. The table on the slide demonstrates the benefit of having thermal energy storage. You know, so displacement of an extra 24 terajoules of energy per annum, um, and it's approximately 15% more economical for the energy displacement um, with the capital investment invested. Uh, and um, the key message is over, over 20 years of the asset light, um, installing a TES will reduce almost half a petajoule of fossil energy utilisation and around $9 million of operational cost. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mars is also uh, partnering with Graphite Energy on a three-year pilot uh, project to demonstrate and prove, uh, prove commercialization of their technology. Mars is a principles-based company and we see it in the mutual interest of, of the technology providers, 
Mars and the wider community to support and help grow emerging technology uptake into the market. Uh, Peter Lemich from Graphite Energy is presenting later in this forum, who will explain their technology. To solve it, <coughs> excuse me, to solve our requirement to be 100% net zero from direct operations, we know that multiple uh, solutions will be needed for thermal energy. Apart from the current economics with electricity pricing and transmission, we see electricity as the most advanced infrastructure and universal energy source. And we see electricity currently as what will most likely be the medium to longer term solution for 80% of our thermal energy challenge across our manufacturing sites. Uh, next slide, please. So, and lastly, I just uh, wanted to touch on a reminder to continue focus on energy efficiency as a critical to our uh, renewable energy journey. Mars's targets to reduce uh, greenhouse gas by 27% by 2025 and 100% by 2050 across our total value chain. At a site level, we are driving to improve energy efficiency by 27% by 2025. And our work has identified that this is a viable optimal target. This prevention investment is the most cost-effective renewable solution currently. It will save significant capital in the future and the benefit of reduced operating costs today. At the Wodonga site, since 2017, we have improved energy efficiency by over 20%. And to, to achieve that, we are investing about 175K per terajoule of energy saved compared with an estimated 350K of capital to switch to renewable energy. And a final point, sites need to understand their energy utilisation, type of energy and when and how much is used to best understand what uh, renewable energy and storage combination is combined. And then, uh, yeah, in closing, um, we see the world is rapidly changing. So Mars had a vision back in 2012 that we as a business needed to change. That was made public in 2015 and is constantly being challenged for what more we can do today. We are part of the solution for tomorrow's future and appreciate what ARENA and the work other companies are doing to support and lead the changes we all require for a sustainable future. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, it's a good, good position to get to for, for the Q&A. Um, I guess the question that is on my mind, uh, and I'll ask kind of, I guess ma mainly um, uh, Thomas and Paul, but happy, happy to get Jared's perspective as well, um, representing various customers. But what, what's the biggest challenge in your respective roles and within your organizations of really kind of hitting the ground running on uh, decarbonising uh, through through thermal storage, um, you know, is it complexity? Is it internal stakeholders? Is it purely the numbers? Um, maybe starting with you, Thomas. Yeah, thanks, for that, Dan. Um, for for us, it's actually around the technology development, um, getting getting technologies that are probably at a um, you know TRL three to six level up to that uh, eight to nine where we can begin to commercialise. And whilst many technologies work at a smaller scale, when we're having a look at the kind of um, gigawatt hours of storage requirement, it's really about that scale up uh, factor that we can then apply. So particularly for the alumina refineries that have such a unique energy footprint and a baseload energy requirement, uh, those are the first things that we're looking at, scanning the market and understanding um, where the technical um, uh, solutions need to happen for our type of baseload requirement and scale. Um, having said that, you know, our organisation is very um, uh, open and understanding of the fact that thermal energy storage will play a very central role in decarbonising our assets. So we're, we're very much on board the need to develop those technologies. It's about now finding uh, the right ones and moving forward uh, to scale up. So over to you, Paul. Um, any other perspectives building on that? Uh, I would say from our perspective, it's it's knowledge. So Mars is um, positioned at the moment to uh, achieve our, our agenda for uh, 
to decarbonize as focused on electricity, which is the, you know, the biggest impact for us um, from a carbon energy footprint uh, across uh, definitely in Australia. So the focus has really been on that. So it's probably knowledge um, and where, you know, the, the work that um, the Australian sites doing, in particular in Wodonga, is, is helping shape and uh, lead the strategy of what we do from a, a natural gas displacement perspective. So, yeah, I would I would just say that the, the, the big challenge is knowledge and the learning curve at the moment and what's the best and best viable options to um to achieve and 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 jared do you have anything to add from what you see i guess and you know i, I do wonder um you know that perspective of what's what's going to happen kind of naturally and what's going to require um some sort of step change um in the markets or regulations mm. any perspective on on the sort of acceleration and <laughs> I mean, look at uh, certainly some renewable uh, thermal certificates and things like that, a bit of a balanced market instead of just renewable electricity. Uh, that might uh, get a bit more uh, oomph into, into the market. But uh, in, in terms of the, the biggest challenge uh, we saw across the board was often space. And that's, if you say, say decarbonising, say, the commercial market as well, it's going to be space for thermal energy storage. And, and so you can, you can reduce that by... Uh, energy efficiency first and, and reduce your heat demand uh, and PCMs. Uh, you can get a lot more higher density there uh, using uh, um, phase change materials, uh, but also it requires some imagination. It's like, oh, I can't, I don't just have a, a standard tank like this. I may need to do a square and I may need to move things around and yeah, a little bit of engineering imagination and understanding of the real heat demand. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's going to uh, help as well. Okay, sort of a slight change of tack, maybe maybe an important question of 100% gas displacement. Is, is it important or viable to get to 100% gas displacement for um, maybe starting with you, Jared, um, for your customers, or is it just about chipping chipping away at the you know the first 30%? What's the I would say there's, uh, there's there's a balance there. I think um, we, we saw this. Uh, if I mention aquatic centres, uh, it's for four days of the year. If they size the a heat pump solution for those four days, they need to about double the size of the heat pump. So, uh, in that case, they sort of leave on the gas as, as one as a backup, and, and two is to handle those those four days. And I think that's that's the right approach, uh, and we need to have that flexibility within policy and incentives to allow that as well, uh, back up and just handling those few days. Um, yeah, within a few years, uh, when you need to do some longer term changes to reduce your heat demand, maybe you start to uh, maybe take you a couple of years to do all the insulation that's required and things like that, then you might find that you can get by in those four days. Um, you might even find after you install it that we didn't, you know, those four days you do get by for. Um, so I think there's a bit of a balanced approach there, I'd say, Dan. Paul and Thomas, any perspectives from, from so your, your major projects and how you're looking to sort of um, cut into the, the, the that gas wedge? Uh, I think from a from a what we've learned in, in from investigation from a uh, from a Mars perspective is that we see a hundred percent displacement, you know, from a from a manufacturing plant that operates 24-7 um, is going to be uh, very challenging. So you know the the investment's probably the 80-20 rule where you get, you know, a lot of the return for 80%, for, for, for um, you yeah, know, the investment for the 80%. 80%. Um, and we are currently looking at um, several different type of solutions to displace, um, to displace 100%. So potentially um, a CSC project, potentially... Um, renewable electricity with thermal energy storage and and potentially offsetting with um, you know for example a, a hydrogen PPA to um, to offset the balance. So I, I think the challenge is one solution is is going to be a challenge across the um, for for one one site that operates twenty four seven. And Thomas, any perspectives from how, how you see the uh, I guess the um, the pace of change is it going to accelerate over time, or is there some early easy wins, and then and then does it get harder? What's the shape of the curve? 
Yeah, so, so look, I, I have to um, agree with uh, many of the comments from, from Jared and Paul here. Um, firstly, we, we see some easy wins, um, and that's principally in just renewable integration um, without any uh, storage. Uh, we then really see some, some fairly low hanging fruit for some of the thermal storage uh, potential again. Um, and for us, it's really important to get a, a phased approach and a sequenced approach. Um, so starting off at that kind of medium scale and then ramping that up to, to the large scale um, as well. So we, we see our, ourselves as being able to really pilot technology and develop technology um, you know, in the next few years, we're, we're quite focused on, on what can we do and, and set the direction. And then it really is about, um, you know, ramping that up and continuing to build uh, thermal storage, um, principally this decade and into the next. I do think that going to that 100% renewable starts to be more and more challenging. And we're finding, you know, similar numbers, you know, that 80% uh, after that, we were starting to having to build out very large scale storage for, for intermittency. Um, and so there we're open to all sorts of different um, options and opportunities. And that's where I think, you know, the integration of thermal storage systems into renewables, into the, the NEM, into, um, you know, firming with, with biomaterials, uh, et cetera, then starts to be all part of the mix uh, to get to that net zero point. Um, but certainly TES for us plays a, a very central role for all of those heat applications that we need and we'll get us uh, most of the way there. Um, uh, we're, we're hoping sooner rather than later as well. Final question from me, and again, just one that I think sort of fits fits the moment, which is uh, you guys are both sort of trying to, I guess, be pioneers and really push the envelope. Uh, yeah, what, you know, how, I mean, how, do, how does that feel? And, you know, I guess, what, what is the role for ARENA in helping organisations like you guys keep pushing faster and harder? Because uh, I certainly, you know, from the discussions we have around industry, we, we know that's hard and we know that there's, you know, this complexity and risk and, um, you know, you don't want to be too far out ahead of everyone and, and make mistakes that cost you money. So just can you give us a perspective on, I guess, the role of ARENA and, you know, how, how, how we can be more helpful to people like yourselves? Uh, I think for, from a Mars perspective, I think, yeah, it is on, uh, you know, from a, from a uh, thermal energy displacement, this is um, stuff that's definitely not novel to Mars from you know, displacing natural gas and, and novel within Australia. So it's potentially a sh sharing in that risk and, and also, but also you know, I think what I mentioned at the start of my conversation was we, our journey um, and the knowledge that we've gained into, you know, what is possible for Mars, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, as advanced as we are today in Australia, which is, as I said, helping lead the global strategy now for, um, for solving uh, the renewable thermal problem um, without the, the knowledge sharing that's, you know, comes through from people like Arena, A2P, Astri and, and so forth. So, so items like this and and um, and so forth are great for us because we're, we're not the um, we're not the uh, the the technology experts. No, indeed. And Jared, you've got your hand up, so over to you. Yeah, uh, I've got uh, one suggestion, and it comes from New Zealand. Giddy funding, G-I-D-I, $750 million they're putting towards uh, renewable process heating. Uh, they've already kicked off and spent about $50 million. If we were to do the same on, a, on a, say, a GDB comparable basis, that's some $4 billion funding. Now, I imagine what these two could do with $4 billion, there'd be no worries, we'll decarbonise. Uh, so, you know, in, instead of, uh, I'll say just, it's, it's great that, that the pre-commercialisation uh, for ARENA, but uh, it's, uh, if you want to speed this up and make it happen uh, 10 years earlier, Dan, uh, go past pre-commercialisation and just get the, the funding to, to really help them out. And they've been, uh, um, been doing this in the first round of $50 million of funding was for, I think, about $10 or $11 uh, per tonne of carbon. Uh, abated so it's uh, extremely economical can they continue that with the next 750 million uh, hard to see but uh, it's, it's a hell of a start mm. right okay interesting we'll have to talk about that further offline jared i'm sure peter's aware of that as well um thomas any perspectives 
on uh, uh, sort of, you know, I guess how to how to just uh, help help accelerate and what what would help. Yeah, so look, um, look, funding's always helpful. Um, however, from from our end, look, I, I think that um, Arena's focus to um, first of a kind industrialisation, integration into operating sites, and a real demonstration that it's possible. I think um, really works well in this space. Um, you know, thermal applications, and whether it's an alumina refinery or Maybe I'm talking out of school, or whether it's maybe the Mars um, facilities, etc. Um, you know, heat is heat. So that knowledge sharing, the proof of concept of what technology works, what can be applied across all sorts of different industries for for different power outputs, I think is important. And if you, um, you know, if if I reflect back on um, you asking what the key challenges were, um, you know, I think we all roughly said. The technology type. Uh, what are we going to What are we going to focus on, and and how to move it forward as quickly as possible? Demonstrations of that is is really essential because it does pave the way for what to focus on. Um, then, when you do go to full scale industrialization and with um, you know a very very large scale thermal storage, then potentially different funding avenues uh, might be of interest. But I think with where we're at anyway. Um, where we're looking to better understand thermal storage systems, get pilots in, understand then how that can be integrated into, um, you know, very high process heat requirement um, uh, facilities are, are really important. Um, finally, I just want to touch on, you know, um, webinars like this, uh, the knowledge sharing that happens uh, across, not just within the industry itself, uh, but then cross industry collaboration, I think is quite important for um, long duration energy storage in general, but thermal energy storage in particular, because it's applicable um, across uh, across industries. So, um, you know, having that um, ability uh, to to interact and engage um, with other proponents that have similar issues um, is is really important in expediting uh, the action that we can take. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so, one more question, I guess, around the potential role of actually really flexing the demand side. Um, it may be um, Todd Thomas and um, Paul just quickly, um, is, you know, is there much possibility to ramp up and down your production or is that kind of in the too hard basket for now to, to try and match the, uh, the variability of the supply curve? Yeah, fantastic. I might just quickly jump in there because that's something that we're very actively involved with. Um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, that 80% might be possible and that 20% starts to be harder. That last 20% starts to be more difficult. We're very conscious of the fact that, um, you know, we've always had cheap, plentiful energy. It's always been easy to manage. It's been easy to store. As energy becomes intermittent, as storage becomes um, more difficult for that last 20%, um, we're really looking at how we can modify our operations so that you don't need to run 24-7. And, um, you know, in the presentation that, that um, I put forward, we're focused on that 24-hour curve at the moment, uh, but we're very conscious that um, a cyclone can, can come in and, and we have a week of rain and, and no solar, um, you know, generation as a result. Um, so how can we operate differently? How can we... Um, take a base load operations, maybe reduce production for a period of time so that we're not having to build that extremely large scale long duration energy storage. We're able to build something that's economic by actually attenuating our production. So I actually think that's a very important part of the mix uh, as well. Paul, anything to add there? Uh, I'd just say from a from a Mars operation perspective in Modonga at least uh, and probably representative across the across the board is that energy is a significant cost for for our plant but it's not the it's not the biggest driver in cost and um, our flex to to follow you know available energy and and so forth is the energy that wouldn't be a driver for it it's um, we've got other bigger costs that that constrain us to operating, um, you know, tw sort of 24 seven. Right, okay. Well, I think it's time to have a break. Um, so um, I think we'll give everyone uh, five, five or 10 minutes and then we'll come back for session three.
Thanks, Dan. I think uh, if we can all go back um, maybe in five minutes, that would be great. We will wait maybe one more minute, but um, then I think we'll we'll need to kick off. There are many other presentations. Um, I'll see you later. Thank you.
I'm certainly ready, Lisa. I think we are ready to go then. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully everyone's uh, back in front of their screens and we're ready to go for the third and final session on, on the technology side. So we've had a perspective on, on the customer side and, and now we, we uh, switch to technologies. So we've got, as you can see on the screen, five uh, different technologies uh, and uh, we'll uh, just get straight into it. Our first speaker is Andrew, CEO of Glacium. Glacium is a project that we've been working with for a number of years. Andrew's been CEO, I think, for a couple of years, so he would have come on board uh, and inherited the ARENA project. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Andrew to um, give you all an update on what Glacium have achieved and where they're going next. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, pleasure to be with you all. You can hear me fine? Yep. Yep. Great. So I'm here to talk about uh, thermal energy storage for industrial and commercial HVAC and refrigeration. Now, it uh, has uh, impact on the heating uh, demand, but only for hot water up to about 90 degrees. And uh, so it, will, it tends to work hand in hand with some of the other high temperature storage and, um, and the like technologies you've been talking about today. Um, perhaps if we can just keep the slides moving. So we do three things. We do thermal energy storage with a phase change material that, that enables us to store uh, cool at uh, various temperatures from minus 27 up to zero. But we team that and we power it with heat pumps, um, which are uh, uh, refrigeration systems that produce heating and cooling and enable you to maximize your use of renewables and to, and to optimize your use of renewables and also the transition from burning gas uh, to and heating in other in heating uh, with electricity, and we have smart software which enables us to actually do that when you need to, which is how we accomplish. Uh, you can move it on, uh, Kate, please. Um, it's how we accomplish these things that our thermal energy storage solutions can provide. They can help you with load shifting. That means uh, being able to shift your load and cut your peaks. And when you can shave your peaks like this, you can make significant savings to your demand. And when you make things to your demand, your demand charges. So uh, we can also do heating and cooling at the same time. Um, and if you have a mismatch between your demand profile, so you need heating at a different time to when you need cooling, then the one system enables you to do both and thermal energy storage enables that to happen. We also enable wholesale price arbitrage by being able to help people look at uh, the, and forecast the cost of energy and to be able to do that um, uh, ahead of time so that they can charge or discharge batteries when they need to. Um, this enables you to counteract the duck curve, which um, is going to take those power prices negative um, on occasion. So you are to optimise for use at those times and avoid using uh, electricity at times uh, when, when there are peak pricing. And the last thing is for some people, they are not able to put uh, solar generated power back into the grid. And so they have what could be called spillage and we're able to provide a solar sponge. Next slide. So I'd like to talk to you about how this works. So um, thank you, Kate, click, yep. We use smart software to help you determine where you take your energy from. If you've got behind the meter solar or if you are taking grid energy and deciding what to do when. And then we convert that using mechanical energy uh, a heat pump uh, to create thermal energy. That could be heating for hot water, but also cooling. Uh, and that can be used to charge our thermal energy storage system. And then that can be used at a later time to discharge for your commercial cold storage applications or for your process cooling applications, or indeed for your building um, HVAC applications for cooling your building. Next one, Kate. Sorry. Click again. And this is what it looks like. So let's play this video. This is a time lapse build of a thermal energy storage system. It's a 2.6 megawatt hour storage system, or it's in fact two of them. Uh, they're a large stainless steel structure. They um, have to be that. They weigh 43 tons when they're fully, uh, fully loaded. And having built that stainless steel structure, which is going to last you about 30 years, uh, we then put inside a manifold, which enables us to di distribute uh, the, the cooling that enables us to charge it and the heating that enables us to discharge it. 
And then uh, inside of each of those thermal energy storage systems, we put about 14 kilometers of HDPE piping. Now this enables us to charge and discharge the system at a very high rate, about 800 kilowatts. And once the system is built like that, we put a insulative skin on it and the appropriate uh, plumbing to enable it to be connected to your field applications. And there you have a, a finished system. The next one, please. So here's some examples of where we've done this. Montague Apples, this is an application where they do load shifting. They have a process hot water demand that they have for eight hours a day, five days a week. I'm generalizing, but you know, that's about, about how it works. So whenever they're doing that, they need to run their heat pump to get that hot water. When they run their heat pump, they've got this free cooling that is coming from that process. And that's used to either supplement their cooling demand or indeed provide all of their cooling demand, which they use for keeping the apples cool. And when they don't have that cooling demand to be able to charge the thermal energy storage system so it can be used later. The hot water is used for cleaning and waxing apples. And this is the perfect fit. It avoids uh, needing to burn um, uh, fossil fuels and avoids the gas connection to their, their site completely. Um, and the, all the associated costs, which would today be even more. Um, that's a, there's a virtual tour of this available online and encourage you to take a moment to uh, note down that URL and you can go and look at it at your leisure. Next slide, please. Reef HQ is in Townsville in uh, North Queensland. It's the headquarters of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And uh, they have a combined heating and cooling demand at different times of the year, different amounts of both. And thermal energy storage that they use, which helps them avoid uh, export limits that they have. Well, in fact, they can't discharge solar PV into the grid, uh, but they've got quite a bit of solar PV and at times more than they uh, need for their office and public space. So this is the built environment, but as well as that, it manages an aquarium which needs to be kept uh, at a tightly controlled temperature that mimics the uh, annual cycle of temperature change in the sea. It's where they keep the, great, the largest display of coral in captivity. Next slide. Uh, Perno Ricard Winemakers, just down the road from where we are here in Mawson Lakes, is uh, the, the home of Jacobs Creek and a uh, large multinational, um, large French uh, um, uh, conglomerate in the beverage industry. Again, they use thermal energy storage for optimizing for the available renewables. They have behind the meter solar, uh, as well as a power purchase agreement, which is, uh, gives them exposure to the wholesale price. And uh, they can do price arbitrage over the market, but the biggest saving they have made is from the reduced peak demand. So being able to shave their peak and uh, reduce the charges associated with that. Next slide, please. So thermal energy storage, um, that's what it looks like. Um, it, can, it can be charged and discharged very quickly and with great efficiency. So we can utilize almost all of the available stored energy, about 95% uh, of the available stored energy, and we can discharge up to 800 megawatts per 2.6 megawatt hour um, system. We've got a range of temperatures, so this can serve a range of different applications. And the, the, app, then the um, system is designed for a very long life. Next page. There are alternatives like um, ice banks and uh, that sort of thing, but we provide a higher density of storage with a smaller footprint and with a higher capacity to uh, charge and discharge um, for the same footprint. Next slide. Um, the purpose of showing you this is not just that we have uh, this very nice uh, human machine interface that enables access to the system remotely, but also to be able to demonstrate that the uh, energy being actively monitored and used to discharge the system, which is just pumping power, provides for a very small coefficient of performance, a very high, I should say, coefficient of performance um, for that discharge operation. So this is how we get um, a very efficient cycle of charging and discharging because it really costs almost nothing uh, to discharge it. And this is uh, the live site at, um, at Reef HQ. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're interested in talking about this, we can help you triage your applications. We can help you with the pre-feasibility analysis with uh, some thermal systems design. 
and we can li liaise with other engineers of your own or uh, consultants who might be working with you. And then the refrigeration contractors and inst for installation and support. So um, feel free to reach out to us and uh, welcome your questions. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much for, for that overview. I'm sure we'll have some good Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, next up, we've got Alexander from MGA. So um, I won't, uh, won't uh, use up too much time doing the intros, um, but Alexander's uh, is the CTO and can tell us all about this very interesting technology. Over to you, Alexander. Thanks, Dan. I'll uh, kick right off if you can move to the next slide, please. All right, um, so we're a bit of a different approach to thermal energy storage in that we use our own novel uh, medium for the thermal storage. That's really what differentiates MGA. Um, our medium is patent technology, came out of the University of Newcastle where we span our company out in uh, 2019. Um, at its heart, it's a composite block which has two components. There's an inert matrix which um, we use a chocolate chip muffin analogy to explain. Basically our matrix is the dough of a, a chocolate chip muffin, which continuously stays solid and gives our blocks their form. Uh, within that we have dispersed grains of a phase change material, um, just like Andrew was just talking about, but in this case, they're embedded as discrete particles within these solid blocks. Uh, that's where the bulk of our energy storage occurs. And the advantage there is that whether that material is molten or solid, um, the block is a solid block. Uh, we don't have to worry about handling a material in liquid and solid phases. Uh, so we heat these blocks up. Um, sorry, yep, thanks. <laughs> uh, we heat these blocks up in operation, either electrically or with a heat supply, which could be from CSP or it could be a waste industrial heat stream. Uh, they melt at the melting temperature of those phase change particles, which stores energy as latent heat. And when we want to recover that energy, we discharge to a heat transfer medium, which freezes the particles, releases that latent heat. Um, and basically the solid part of that block very rapidly imports and exports that heat from the PCM and allows us to charge and discharge very rapidly. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, so that enables us to have quite a high energy density because we're um, using latent heat for our storage capacity and we're also targeting high temperature thermal storage. So we have three key systems available in which we basically swap out the material that we're using as that phase change material to match its melting points to uh, the desired temperature of the use case. So our core, our core product is at 577 degrees. We also have a system at 660 degrees and another under development at uh, 713 degrees. So we are targeting the medium to high temperature um, range of TES for our technology, which enables us to achieve a high energy density um, and discharge to you know, lower temperature applications as necessary through heat exchanges. Next slide, please. Uh, we make our blocks using uh, sustainable supplies as much as possible. So, um, you know, I'm sure some among you saw a melting temperature at 660 and thought aluminium straight away. Um, we typically use recycled aluminium for that because we are quite tolerant to alloying constituents in the aluminium, um, which many other applications might not be because our main concern is the melting temperature and the latent heat. Um, so we're quite, quite resistant to using recycled aluminium supplies. Uh, and we've gained a pretty good understanding of how different grades of aluminium alloy will perform in our blocks. Uh, that enables us to achieve quite a low cost of production for our material, even though it has some pretty advanced energy storage uh, capabilities. So we're looking at similar sort of energy densities to what you'd achieve with lithium ion batteries um, in the order of 250 kilowatt hours per cubic meter and upwards, depending on the temperature range um, in modular blocks, which can easily be scaled up to large scale systems. Um, and I think that really exemplifies the core sort of advantages that we're talking about today with TES, uh, the modularity, the very large scalability and the reliance on uh, low cost, readily available materials. 
Next slide, thanks. Um, so the three systems that I mentioned are in various levels of development. Basically, the 577 and 660 are both production ready. Uh, 713 is a bit more complicated. In that case, we're actually developing our own ternary metallic alloy with a targeted operating temperature. Uh, so it's a very specialized grade, whereas 577 and 660 are a bit more, a bit more robust. Uh, but each of those, we recommend use around 100 degrees on either side of that phase change temperature. Uh, that's basically what we export our heat at. It's a very stable export because of that phase change. And then we can sort of de-superheat effectively down to whatever application is necessary. Next slide, thanks. All right, um, so I've talked a lot about the block, but the wider system, we heat up using electricity or heat. That heat could come from CSP. Um, we insulate our blocks in a large tank and we discharge via a gas loop. Um, that gas loop can easily be heat exchanged into steam using a waste heat boiler or um, a heat recovery steam generator, as uh, Thomas mentioned earlier. Uh, we can use that steam to drive a turbine if we want to create electricity, or we can just export directly as heat to industry. Uh, we have our own concepts available at the five megawatt hour level, all the way up to um, two gigawatt hour concepts. And we've sort of, you know, developed the technology with the large scale in mind. Next slide, thanks. All right, uh, so we're targeting a range of applications, trying to keep it as agnostic as possible. Um, an interesting synergy that came up earlier was the mention of hydrogen. We're actually collaborating with Toshiba and uh, Graphite Energy, who are on the call today as well, um, on a hydrogen play. So it's a solid oxide electrolyzer, which produces hydrogen with uh, steam as an input. And that basically lowers your energy requirement to produce hydrogen, um, unlocking cheaper hydrogen, and also um, increasing the capacity factor of your electrolyzer because you're producing from stored thermal energy rather than grid electricity. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting technological crossover that's kind of emerging. Next slide, thanks. All right, so um, rapid scale up is what we're, what we're all about. Um, we're currently commissioning a production line that's capable of 240 megawatt hours of storage capacity per day at our factory in Tomago, New South Wales. Uh, we're scaling that up next year to be 2.4 gigawatt hours per day, which is targeting um, multiple 100 megawatt hour scale projects. And we have another scale up under development for 2024, which is targeting uh, 24 gigawatt hours of capacity per year. So at that scale where um, you know, legitimately looking at large scale, um, gigawatt scale sort of energy storage applications, which is really necessary for this um, decarbonization of, of large industry. Next slide, thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much. Contact details are there and happy to talk to anyone who's interested. Thanks. Thanks very much. Alex, and uh, straight straight into the next one. Another another very interesting and very uh, different technology, Raygen, a company that's well known to Arena over many years. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to our speaker from Raygen, whose name I don't have in front of me and I haven't met yet, but um, I look forward, I guess Kira, is that right? Yes, yeah, that's yes, right, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, um, look forward to hearing from you, Kira, and, uh, and uh, yeah, over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, you can skip ahead to the next slide, please. I'll just give you a brief overview of Raygen's technology. Um, we actually are an energy generation as well as energy storage technology, which is quite unique in the space. So um, I'll briefly talk about the generation side before jumping into the storage side. Uh, on the left um, hand side of this slide, you'll see the PV ultra generation system, which is comprised of a field of mirrors on the ground, which are used to concentrate light um, into a receiver. Now this looks very similar to CSP, but instead of having um, molten salts in the receiver, we actually have very efficient solar cells, so photovoltaic cells that are typically used in the satellite industry um, that we manufacture into modules at our module manufacturing facility in uh, Nunawading in Melbourne. And I'll actually hold up one of the modules here. Apologies that 
it might be a little bit blurry or small to see. Um, but this module is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and we concentrate up to a thousand times the concentration of the sun onto a receiver filled of these modules. Um, and at that concentration, this 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter module can produce 2.5 kilowatts of electricity and five kilowatts of heat. So it's an extremely um, power dense module. Um, and we have a unique synergy in this uh, energy flow diagram, if you will, at point three, which is where we collect the byproduct heat that is formed during the concentration process. So in order for these solar cells to operate efficiently, we need to keep them cool um, to about 90 degrees Celsius. So what we're doing is we're continuously pumping water through the back of the modules to cool them down and extracting that heated up water in the um, in, so extracting that thermal energy in the form of heated water, which we then store in a pit thermal energy storage as is typically used in the district heating network in Europe. Um, back over to the generation side, we can then either export the electricity that we generate in the receiver directly to the grid, or we can funnel it into our storage system as well by using it to, to cool down a second body of water, which is chilled down to uh, four degrees Celsius, giving us two bodies of separated water, um, one heated up to 90 degrees and the other cooled to four, which gives us this um, temperature difference that is equivalent to pumped hydro uh, energy storage that is offset by one kilometer in height. So it's an enormous amount of potential energy that's stored in those two pits. Um, we then, uh, if we want to create electricity on demand, oh, sorry, one second, just go back for a sec. Yeah, uh, I'll just finish explaining how the cycle works and then go uh, into more detail on the energy storage side. So when we want to generate electricity on demand, we uh, use the heated water, so the 90 degrees, to boil ammonia, which is then used to drive a turbine similar to a steam turbine. Um, and then the zero or the four degree water is then used to condense that ammonia back down. Uh, and then that forms the uh, closed loop cycle of the system. So we're able to provide synchronous generation on demand using the energy that is stored in the form of hot and cold water. Uh, if you skip to the next slide, um, this is just a little graphic of how those pits are actually charged. So when we charge the system, the cold pit is charged using a, an industrial chiller um, to cool water down to four degrees. And on the hot side, as I mentioned, we use um, the byproduct heat from the solar generation um, to put 90 degrees into the pit. So in terms of stored capacity of energy, um, that is totally dependent on pit size. So the larger the pit, the higher your storage capacity. And it, um, because we're using water as the storage medium, it's a very low um, marginal cost to increase the amount of stored capacity. Uh, and another caveat that I should mention as I talk about the next couple of slides is that when we talk about stored um, energy, I'm talking about electrical energy, not stored thermal energy capacity. So if you could skip to the next slide, I'll just give a brief overview of the commercial demonstration that we're currently constructing in Car Warp, Victoria, which is about a six hour drive northeast of Melbourne. Uh, so we're currently building the world's largest next generation storage project at 50 megawatt hours of stored electricity. Um, that plant is compri comprised of four of our PV Ultra fields, each generating four megawatts of electricity. And we then also couple that with a three megawatt ORC engine, which is typically used in um, the geothermal industry. And we've got our hot and our cold pit, which have a uh, storage capacity of 50 megawatt hours. So that's 17 hours of continuous output of the three megawatt turbine. Uh, we expect this facility to be fully operational and commissioned in November of this year. And these are um, actual photographs of the site. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side that the PV Ultra um, fields are now all constructed with all of the heliostats being fully assembled. Um, and in the central photo, you can see that we are commissioning the solar towers at the moment. Um, 
The hot and cold pits are also fully constructed. They are insulated, lined, and sealed, which means that this is a closed loop system. So once you've filled up the hot and the cold pit, um, that's kind of, you just need to fill it up once and then it's a closed loop system. So we don't need to continuously be topping up the water. Um, next slide, please. All right, so how does the technology scale? Well, we've designed the PV Ultra system to be um, deployable in these one megawatt blocks for future projects as well. So if we want to increase the amount of solar at a given site, we would just deploy as many PV Ultra fields as can fit on the amount of land available. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, thermal hydro part, um, at the moment we're using a three megawatt turbine the idea for subsequent projects is to scale that up to 25 megawatts. This is kind of the upper limit in the geothermal industry, um, but we get incredible economics of scale by going to that size. So just for reference, the three megawatt ORC um, costs about 2.7 million Australian dollars and scaling up from three to 25 megawatts um, and only costs about $5 million. So you get incredible um, economics of scale for that system. Now the pits will also increase. So on the right hand side, you see this is an artist impression of a project that we're currently developing with Photon Energy, which is a solar energy developer. Um, that would be, the total project would be 300 megawatts of solar with a 150 megawatt grid connection and 3.6 gigawatt hours of stored electricity. Um, now, when we go up in that scale of uh, energy storage, we also have to increase the size of the pit. So like I mentioned, our storage capacity is based on the amount of water that we have in the system. So uh, the current 17 megawatt hour project in Car Warp has two pits that are about 17,000 meters cubed, scale, uh, which is equivalent just to kind of give you a rough idea of what that means. It's about each pit is filled with about as much water as would go into seven Olympic swimming pools. Uh, scaling up to 3.6 gigawatt hours uh, would require 12 pools um, of about 100 Olympic swimming pools equivalent of water. So it's a very large amount of water. But like I said, once you fill those pits up once, you seal them and then you aren't required to continuously top them up. Uh, and then next slide, just quickly touch on the applications. So we are targeting grid power plant sized projects to start off with because this will give us the economics of scale in order to be able to do smaller um, remote off-grid projects as well. Uh, and then of course, we're also um, similarly to what's been mentioned already looking at working on how can we provide green renewable energy to hydrogen mega projects as well. So those are kind of also in the pipeline, but a little bit further into the future. Thank you. Sorry, just trying to find the mute button. Thanks very much, Kira. Um, our next speaker is Peter Limich, I believe, from uh, Graphite Energy, who we've heard referred to by previous speakers, um, also known, well known to Arena over a number of years. So Peter, over to you to uh, give us the update on what you guys are up to. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, you know, if you could just go back to the first slide, that'd be great, thank you. So just very quickly, uh, Graphite Energy has developed a thermal energy storage system that basically uses uh, graphite as the storage medium. Uh, what you can see here on, on uh, the screen at the moment is the unit that is currently going through a factory acceptance testing program uh, before it's shipped to Mars in uh, uh, the last quarter of this year. Okay, next slide, thank you. Um, very simply, if, um, what we're about is uh, renewable energy converted to heat, providing zero carbon for industry using the TES system to enable the energy transition. Thank you. Um, our system is uh, very uh, indifferent for want of a better word to the uh, energy input. We can take electricity, PV or wind. We can take thermal energy in the form of CST, bio, bioenergy, waste heat. Uh, as I say, indifferent to the energy input. Uh, and then we've got a separate process for producing hot air or steam 
and by using the TES, we're able to decouple the time of use from the time of demand. Thank you. Um, just the system has an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of how it's configured and how it can be designed to operate. But in, in our initial de deployment phases, you know, these are the typical characteristics that we are um, targeting. Uh, it's a containerized, modular, scalable, transportable solution that is targeting, you know, typically uh, process temperatures in 150 to 250 degrees and around the 10 to 20 bar. Um, we can store the temperature in there up to 900 degrees, but it depends on the, uh, the process requirement. And the amount of storage that's required is just becomes a, 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 a function of the, how we configure the units. Thank you. Um, as Paul said earlier in his presentation, um, we are deploying in collaboration with Mars um, this first unit. Um, it's working with Mars to help them meet their carbon neutral um, uh, objectives. Um, we're using renewable energy to displace natural gas. Uh, in this particular configuration will be a supplementary steam supply and it, this particular unit will be getting installed at Mars in the uh, last quarter of this year. Um, I think you know, from our perspective, the relationship with Mars has been tremendous, particularly in respect of their willingness to want to collaborate. And that has been able to help us accelerate our deployment. And we look forward to working with them over the coming three year program. Um, um, given that the getting towards the end of the presentation, Dan, I think that's probably enough from me at this point and uh, happy to rejoin as we get into the questions. Right, so thank you very much, Peter. Uh, fi final uh, technology presentation is from 1414, and I think we've got Mahesh um, standing in for Jordan on this one. Uh, so without no. further. Sorry, so, sorry Jane. It's, uh, um, I am actually available. Ah, yes. uh, hi, Jordan. Yes. There, there, there you are. Thank yep. You. No, we uh, we did have a um, shareholder meeting this morning that uh, was able to be sorted out in the time, so I was able to join the meeting. Great to hear. Okay, Jordan, over to you. Thanks very much. Okay, if we just go to the, the next slide. Uh, now, I think we've seen a version of this one earlier, emphasising you know, the, the the opportunity for process heat. Um, and I think part of that emphasis earlier was uh, around the lower temperature, um, but 14, 14 degrees, uh, the, the name, the company name gives a clue that um, yeah, we're targeting the, the higher end of that. So really 800 degrees and above, but that, there's also opportunities um, lower than that as well. So uh, on to the next one. So that, that's the core of the company is developing the, what we're calling the Cybox, the thermal energy storage technology. That's in conjunction with Woodside Energy Technology, who are a, a partner or collaborator as part of that development. Uh, it's also worth noting too that the, the company has a separate um, development, which is around the Aurora project uh, in the north of um, South Australia and Port Augusta. That's in conjunction with another Australian company that you, most people are familiar with being Vast Solar. Um, and while there's there are aspects of um, technology overlap, that's really a commercial emphasis. So yeah, today I'll be really be talking about that cybox uh, and what we're doing uh, with the support of Woodside Energy. So on to the next one. And conceptually, how the cybox works is sort of similar to what we've seen from some of the other um, technology developers there in, in Graphite and MGA. Uh, we're taking that uh, renewable energy source in using heating elements to provide the heat. Uh, but uh, where we're obviously trying to do things differently or everyone's playing in their own area is uh, part C, um, which is around the uh, storage media. Uh, the heart of ours is based on silicon, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about more about in the, in the following slides. Uh, now that gives some, some key advantages and, and different performances, but essentially because of its phase change and latent heat properties. Um, and while that has its advantages and, and, and IP is about also addressing some of the challenges, it's not, uh, and it's the heart of the system, it is important to emphasize that the, the heat transfer arrangement out of that as well. So 
um, optimizing that to get efficient and dispatchable heat out of uh, the arrangement is also uh, a key part of the engineering that we're working on. So all those um, elements working together uh, between the heating, uh, the silicon storage material and the energy recovery enable us to provide, uh, get hot air out. That's the, that's the heat transfer medium that we're working with. Uh, and then similarly that, that hot air at about a thousand degrees and, and low pressure can be used uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, on to the next one. Uh, so the, one of the reasons that we're using silicon is because of the, the, its high latent heat capacity as it's changing through that solid to liquid phase that we, we don't use pure silicon, um, even though that's uh, at the melting temperature of 14, 14, degree, 14 degrees is the name of the company. We do add some alloying elements into there that enable us to adjust those properties, um, which includes the temperature, um, uh, uh, but as well as other properties as well. And I with the, the main aim of the storage media is to get a um, compact storage arrangement uh, that's, that enables us to have a smaller footprint compared to other devices, uh, but we still need to protect it. It still needs to be robust uh, that's the, over the lifetime of it and still enable uh, efficient heat transfer as well. So that's a, a key part of, of what the engineers are working on is the arrangement of those alloying elements and the containment to, to, to keep it all intact, as well as efficient recovery out. Uh, on to the next one. And even though the, the, the technical side is very interesting, commercially it has to work too uh, as well. Now we are trying to get form clean heat uh, and competing against fossil fuels, which is, is, you know, is, is difficult. Um, so you know, how that is, is uh, the, the equation that's sort of represented there is provide, designing a system um, that can access the lowest cost uh, inputs being uh, renewable electricity um, if there's something that increases the price or the relative price of fossil fuels being the location of where it is, the market or, or um, the price on carbon, as well as the work that we can do, so which is the design of the system, how large it is, uh, et cetera. Uh, but also you know, that's what the R&D is there is to uh, drive that down. Um, but actually the first one is to substantiate where Cybox sits uh, uh, relative to um, other technologies and fossil fuels. So that's um, just as important as not just the technical development work, but it's also the commercial uh, development work too. So on to the next one. So how we're going about that uh, at the moment is um, and with a project that's, uh, this is one that's principally supported by Woodside Energy. Um, we also have a uh, government grant to the uh, Modern Manufacturing Initiative. So we're building a one megawatt hour thermal storage system in, in our workshop uh, right at the moment. Uh, that's that's it's currently underway to be due to be completed by the end of this year so that, that'll prove the, the to how the technology works at that one module scale um, and enable us to have the, the design basis and engineering, engineering parameters as well as the costing parameters to scale it up so that's really the work from there uh, is to take um, is to leverage off that where we want to go to is multi-module scales based on applications uh, and uh, so that's the, the next phase is to, beyond this, is to prove the technology working. Um, so go on to the next slide. So an example might be for that next stage is, is integrating into an application at a pilot scale where we have the opportunity to, to work with a, a potential um, site that has access to that um, renewable electricity, can take that in, into uh, a number of modules at a pilot scale, it might be uh, um, multiple, uh, probably two to 10 modules, uh, recover that heat and integrate that into the process via a, a turbine or heat exchanger or a heat recovery steam generator and integrate that into the process. Um, once we, uh, uh, the strategy is to demonstrate this working at a pilot scale and then to scale that up to, to larger applications, uh, really to get to the commercial point um, and uh, hence drive it from through the, the TRL challenge um, that you know, has been mentioned um, earlier. Um, so on to the, the next slide. So where we think that the sidewalk technology has a particular advantage is, is those sites seeking high temperature heat. Uh, it is, is unique that the temperature that we're operating at uh, and can store at. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the particular advantage of us. That's not to say that we're 
money limits for those other applications as well. Uh, so other applications where we can um, st value stack to that as well. So not just the heat, the heat and power, there's also um, uh, opportunities um, or even lower temperatures as well, where we can use the, the delta T from the salt box um, for, to, to drive uh, other benefits. As part of that too, obviously, you know, it, it needs access to renewable energy. So where there's um, sites that have access to that, um, where there is a particular driver uh, for it, uh, for to decarbonisation, be it the cost of fossil fuels, uh, the market demand for clean um, project projects as well. Um, and, and finally, uh, I think it was, was mentioned earlier, no footprint bring in, in issue. Well, now that's also where Cybox has an advantage with that phase change material, where we can get a smaller uh, compact system and, and by the modularity, scale that up to particular applications. So they're the sort of um, targets that, that, that we're looking to, to uh, take the technology forwards with. Um, and uh, hopefully that's given you an, an interesting summary of the technology. Over to, to the Q&A. Thanks very much, Jordan. Indeed, you know, really interesting to see yeah, again, a quick quick flyover of five very different technologies, some similarities, a lot of differences. Um, I mean, Kira and Ray, Ray Jen, I, I guess you, you guys sort of are a little bit different, um, I think, to the other technologies, mainly in that you're, you're really now chasing the sort of grid-connected utility-scale electricity generation. Um, but I don't know if you can give a bit of a perspective on kind of what you, and I know you've only been there for a, a year or so, but... You know, why did you make that decision to focus on that market as opposed to the, I guess, other applications that you previously were chasing? It's a really good question. Um, so for us, one of the really big hurdles to overcome was high initial capital costs at smaller scale. So uh, we did a lot of business development work trying to sell this idea of co-generation of heat and electricity to um, smaller industrial customers. Um, and we really found that just at the small kind of three, four, five megawatt scale projects, our um, capex was just too high at the small volume. So we would really need to be developing a lot of those smaller projects at the same time to be able to get the e economies of scale. Um, whereas if we focus instead on grid connected projects, one project alone will unlock 300 megawatts worth of PV ultra towers. Um, and so as we start to develop more and more of these large grid scaled projects, um, we're very open to the idea of then also being able to deploy on a smaller scale and leverage that supply chain. Thanks. And, and uh, in terms of this Q&A, and I'm glad that we've got a good solid half an hour. Um, I'd like to really do some uh, interesting matchmaking here. So if, you, if, you, if anyone on the panel wants to ask a question of someone else, put your hand up. I'd really like to hear some of the customers ask the technologies questions and some of the technologies ask customers questions. Um, I guess I'll start off with, you know, I guess the generic question to the technologies, particularly those seeking industrial customer offtake, although I don't know, maybe for, for Rio, you can uh, you know, probably provide an offtake to, to uh, a utility scale project too. Um, so, you know, in front of the meter, behind the meter. But um, what are the biggest challenges for the technologies, I guess, in, in, in your grappling with in finding those early customers for those first, you know, beyond a pilot, but, you know, that early, st early stage commercial demo. So I don't know um, who wants to start with that one. Um, maybe Alexander um, or, or, or Peter. Um, uh, you know, what's the biggest challenges you're, you're, you're facing? I, I can, and I can understand that a part of it is just explaining the technology. Right, and getting people to really understand it takes a while. Um, yeah, if I can jump in, um, I think maybe technological awareness is probably one of the biggest ones because even though we're relying on a lot of uh, pretty standard equipment, um, you know, heat recovery steam generators, heat exchangers, resistive heaters, they're all tried and proven technologies. Uh, really those huge utility scale TES projects haven't been demonstrated yet. So it does appear to be um, you know, a higher risk alternative to technologies that are being commercialized quite quickly at the moment, like batteries, um, which are easy to cut and paste and, you know, prove on a, a half a megawatt scale and then duplicate up to very, very large scales. Um, I think I think that's probably the biggest one, just the, the rapidly growing awareness and demonstration. Peter, I don't know if you want to jump in or any, anyone else. Um, Jordan's got his yeah, hand up. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I, I might go to Jordan with the hand up and then Peter. 
Yeah, no, I, I think similar to, to what uh, uh, was just mentioned just then by Alex, but also by Thomas earlier, it's so that, that the fundamentally it's, it's making the, the, the gap from you know, TRL five or six to, to eight or nine, which is uh, there's a range of factors you know, around that. You now, part of that scale, you know, one of the, the key aspects we like Alex has mentioned is thermal stuff, how that scales, uh, the modularity is, is, is different from, uh, from, from the battery, et cetera. So uh, how to, to demonstrate, say, or to, to integrate uh, our technology at a larger scale to show its real application benefits, but managing risk uh, around that as well. So that, that, that's, that's a key barrier, um, but it's also uh, electricity network connection too is part of that. We're, we're all relying on uh, those three people are saying there's a significant amount of electricity in. Now, the, the, the network process uh, around that, um, if it's available or not, is uh, there's time and cost associated with that. So, uh, and then there's just the, the process integration risk of if, if we're great, we, we might have heat available and uh, hopefully it's reliable, but no, the, the end users we're targeting have got in general. Uh, Processes that are running 24 hours a day, they they, they have to operate as well. So it's to me, it's it's it's, it's overcoming scale um, of, of thermal technology to scale up net, net electricity network risk and and managing process integration risk. Thanks, Jordan. Peter, do you would you like to add to that? Yeah, look, I think Jordan's spot on. I think that that transition through TRL and into early, early stage commercial. Um, deployment is the challenge, you know, and I think it is particularly um, um, challenging, you know, in a, in an industry, particularly for process heat industries, because um, it, a boiler is a very well known, you know, means of generating heat, and to displace that, um, you know, you're asking somebody to take a risk on their, you know, mission critical process, which is, you know. They don't not in the business of generating energy. They're in the business of making pet food, or they're in the business of you know iron ore mining. They're not really about you know energy storage. Energy storage is a means to an end, and I think there's a challenge to um, you know I think it's a challenge to kind of traverse that TRL landscape. And Andrew, what's your perspective? Yeah, I'd like to suggest there's, oh, look, I totally agree with everything the other guys have said and uh, Glacian, you know, perhaps a, a little bit earlier to the table and not quite the complexity of technology um, as, as the other technologies, but certainly working in a different space. But I would also suggest, and this might be something these guys are yet to uh, come across at scale, but um, hybrid energy solutions design isn't a skill where there are a lot of good people around to help you with it right so it needs you know your decarbonization journey needs a thorough analysis it needs to be pulled apart and put back together in different ways that begin at the actual application and don't try to do these drop-in solutions as peter said you know just pull out a boiler and stick in some sort of notional um you know renewable equivalent so you know, bringing that together needs a lot of new thinking. And even for big companies, you know, we're dealing with a big French pharma company um, and, uh, and they've got their own engineers at the wazoo, but um, they still, you know, take a lot of time to get their head around this sort of uh, approach to it. But when they do, um, they're really starting to get the message and they can see that, well, if we do this in Brisbane, we could do this anywhere in the world. And, um, you know, what Glacium's doing with heat pumps and thermal storage can really work for what we're doing. And now, you know, it's, it's not a solution for the other guy's technology, unfortunately, but, uh, or a problem for the other guy's technology, but um, I'm sure the same issues uh, pertain. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna ask, uh, is our customers, Thomas, Paul, um, uh, Jared, are you guys all, all online? I, I don't see a photo, so you may, you may have dropped off not knowing that I was gonna try and, uh, drag you into this um, Q&A, but that is Jared's there. Okay, so... Um, um, uh, so is Thomas, by the way. Uh, Thomas, great, okay. I'd like, uh, I'd like to ask the question to, 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 to you guys. Um, um, you know, I probably asked it a little bit before, but sort of just to get the conversation going, um, you know, where, where do you uh, uh, sort of hybridization, um, you know, dealing with new technologies that are unproven, 
um, you know, what, what, what do you think the customers can sort of bring to that or what's the help that the customers need, uh, whether it is the advisors, the uh, EPCs, what's the missing piece? Yeah, so maybe I can I can um, just quickly go first and, and look, it's, it's really interesting to hear the viewpoints of everyone uh, on this call. And, and the reason is the, the challenges that you've all just laid out just previously, uh, TRL or a hybridisation are actually exactly the same challenges that, that we're grappling with. Um, if you think about the, the transition to, to net zero, you almost put yourself on a, on a pathway very early and lock yourself into a, a certain type of technology um, quite early on. And so there's almost right now a, a you know, a world of, of opportunity. And I actually mean that quite, quite genuinely. Um, there's everything from hydrogen through to ammonia, through to thermal storage. You can use electricity to heat. You can store electricity to then generate thermal heat. Um, so there's a real, um, you know, different type of technology landscape. And so... Selecting the right one, I think, is is one of the key challenges. What we've been focused on uh, quite quite strongly is on exactly that. <clears throat> what type of technologies can we deploy that don't lock us in to, to just the one pathway? Um, and, and how can we then um, scale that technology up? So we might be starting with a TRL5 technology. Um, can we make a meaningful contribution to our existing assets? with maybe a, a less proven technology, um, if we find that that's acceptable, if it's working, then we can continue to build on the existing um, demonstration and continue to scale that up um, over the years as, as our um, TES requirements uh, continue to increase and, and as we head towards that net zero. So really there's some of those key points that we're um, kind of working through. I think in particular for thermal energy storage, um, the one thing that we're realising is what it's very good for and where we can find some very, very high efficiencies is in steam generation. So that once the energy is stored as a thermal mass, you're then able to generate steam with it in a, in a very efficient manner. Um, so they're the type of linkages that we're looking at, at the, in the near term. Then understanding that if you do have a thermal energy storage system, it could then potentially be applied to electricity further down the track as technology continues to develop. So it's not locking ourselves in, but certainly commencing on that direction and commencing on that decarbonisation journey as quickly as possible with a plan to then scale up as soon as the technology becomes commercial. I think, I think that's some of the key, key points for us. And maybe, um, Paul, if I can th throw to you, again, sort of, you're probably quite, you're quite different to, to rear as an organisation, but yeah, what's the uh, what's the missing piece in the puzzle that would make your life easier in in um, that decarbonisation journey and really testing new technologies uh, and scaling them up? Uh, well, I was thinking as Thomas was talking, I've, I've got exactly the same philosophy. It's that you know, there's, there is a wide range of um, technologies and solutions available, uh, and I think as you know, mentioned in my presentation that. I see that you know, it's not going to just be one solution that is um, is viable. So we need to look across the board, and um, that. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. The the from a Mars perspective, um, the. Um, you know, we need to start, right? So our, our, our journey is to be carbon neutral by 2040. And if we don't start somewhere, then we're not going not gonna to achieve it. So I think it's, you know, we've got to take a leap of faith and say that um, we need to pick what the best uh, approach is and start with it. We've got, some, we've got some disco music in the background. I don't know if, any, yeah, someone's, someone's got on mute. I don't know where that was, but... Uh... Yeah, no, agree, agree, Paul. Sort of starting and I guess starting fast, you know, without obviously making a big mistake is, you know, the key, I guess. Um, Jared, I don't know if you want to add any anything into the mix now or hold yeah, it. I thought I'd maybe just bring a slightly different perspective there. Uh, and that um, <clears throat> relates to sort of metering. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about is retrofitting of existing plant, which is 
inherently very expensive. But there is one advantage on the retrofit model is you know you can map exactly what your heat profile is. So you can size your new heating system and your thermal storage really well. However, there's very limited amount of, 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 of uh, metering out there, especially on gas, natural gas usage. Uh, most people at best have like a, a monthly bill and, and they just don't know how that varies during the day. If you don't know how that profile is, how do you size your thermal energy storage properly? Uh, so I'd say for me, missing piece is, is that better data on, on gas usage and, or heat demand. And look, there is solutions coming out right now from CSIRO, smart solutions which bolt onto an existing gas meter. And, and for my mind, they just, they just can't come quick enough. Uh, that's, that's the real game changer there. So that, uh, yeah, so that when you, if you've got a, a five megawatt steam boiler, uh, you replace that with a two megawatt or a three megawatt uh, um, heat pump or other solution, not a like for like. Um, so, to, and to do that, you need the data. Um, look, I'm going to completely change tack in terms of what one of the, I think one of the interfaces between a technology company that's sort of scaling up and, and a big off taker that's um, trying to decarbonize is sort of. Um, financing risk and you know I think Raygen saw this as well in terms of you know it's trying to strike offtake agreements with customers um, I don't know who on the technology side wants to sort of um, try and respond to that question about you know you're trying to raise capital to raise capital you need a um, clear business plan and a pipeline to have a pipeline you need a balance sheet um, who wants to go first in terms of I guess the, um, the, the chicken and egg problem of trying to rapidly scale up to be bankable at the same time as trying to find your first five megawatt project. So Andrew's got his hand up. Kira, <laughs> if you can start if you like. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just briefly comment on this one. Um, so for us to get over that initial hurdle, who is going to pay for the first four megawatt project? Well, um, we actually raised the funds to pay for it ourselves. Um, we found that in terms of finance, that was just the quickest way home. And once we had that kind of operational plant, that would provide us with at least some data for bankability for future larger scale projects. Um, and the others, also the other strategy is to try to find the right existing partners that have the, the um, balance sheet that we can partner with that will support us. So who exists globally, who um, that is a large enough energy company that has the balance sheet that could support a region um, backed project um, and that believes in the technology enough to back us. Um, so that's kind of how we've gone about doing that. Thanks. Yeah, and um, obviously perhaps a, a journey comment. that's continuing. But Andrew, are you, are you going to jump in, or someone else? Yeah, perhaps I'd comment. Uh, ex you know, exactly along the same lines as Kira, except slightly different context because we're not serving the energy sector itself, um, but we are serving uh, substantial energy users. So whilst we are yet to see this uh, materialise in Australia, we have a you know some interesting proposals up with uh, Meatworks at the moment for energy as a service in Australia, but we have a contract in, in uh, New Zealand with a energy company providing energy as a service. Um, they're, they're the company that has the gas uh, that is being turned off. They, they really want to turn off the gas. It's a slightly different situation to Australia, but you know the energy company wants to turn off the gas. They want to put up a, uh, an electric electrified solution, and that's for a large protected cropping application. So you know it, it's really uh, a nice mix. Um, they, they're bringing the balance sheet, as Kira is sort of suggesting, um, for, a, for a modest sized company with a reasonable energy demand and certainly a big power bill that's skyrocketing based on gas prices. And, um, you know, I think working with those sort of partners um, has potential, but, you know, it, it also brings with its own challenges. You know, they want to approach things like an EPC, they're slow and, slow and uh, laborious in terms of working through the risk um, profile and ticking every box. Um, but if you can get them to support you in that process, perhaps to pay you as a smaller company, um, and even you know even to support the uh, end user in that activity, um, you know that can go. And perhaps that's something Arena can advocate for, and A2EP can advocate for. Jordan, uh, and then Alex. On mute. Yeah. Look, uh, I think similar to what Kira. 
So similar to what Kira has said, you know, our journey has been similar to that. Uh, we're, we're ASX listed, so um, uh, raising capital from uh, no shareholders who believed in the journey has, has given this been the start. Uh, you know, having Woodside Energy uh, Technology is you know, is just contacting. You know, it's just similar. You know, has someone with the balance sheet that believes in the technology that can that can see um, the potential as well. You know, at the moment, no, that's really just around the one megawatt hour module, but no, that's where we're hoping the journey um, continues beyond that to the pilot scale other applications. Um, but no, crucial so far throughout the journey has also been government support too. You no, know, we've got the federal government grant that's around the current technology. We, we've had other ones in the past too. So it's, uh, to me, it's 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 it's, it's marrying that all, all, all that up you know, from for the next pilot scale uh, application. It'll still be. 14, 14 degrees, you know, putting up, you know, doing that because you know, there's there's a, there's risk there, but finding other ways, for other stakeholders that help manage that risk to 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 prove uh, at, at each progression and through scale and technology risk, the the benefits are there until it gets to commercialisation and you know, it's de-risked and, and you know, hopefully away we go. It's a successful enterprise. So it's I think that's a similar journey to what others have described. Thanks, Jordan. Alex, uh, any, anything to add there before we change tack again? Um, yeah, I think just commenting again on what Kira said, that the, the partnership's really a key, I think. Um, you know, MGA are not going to be building utility scale power stations. <laughs> um, our core product is our bricks. That's what our, our manufacturing capacity and our expertise is in. So really the partnerships are needed with those sort of blue chip EPCs to deliver on large scale projects. Um, and those kind of partnerships also open up a whole new avenue of different financing options, which aren't an option for a, a low TRL startup. Um, so I think without those sort of partnerships in place, it's a much, much slower journey. It's just, um, you know, doing the technical due diligence and um, proving out that the, the end use is worth the, the time required to go through the partnership formation and that sort of thing. Thanks very much, guys. Okay, so I'll just uh, check if Julia and um, Dom Daniel. Are, are on the line. Dan, yep. it's Peter. Yep. Just want to kind of reiterate what everyone else said there. Like, clearly, investing in your own initial projects is key, and finding the right partners to help you do that is, you know, inevitable. But, uh, you know, I'm hoping you're going to help us solve that problem, mate. Well, we're always here to help. That's, that's uh, our mantra. Um, but yeah, Julia, Dobby, you guys are a lot of interested in, you know, the, the sort of overarching perspective, if you are there, just to what you're seeing uh, internationally, Julia, or um, Dom, any observations from you? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, sorry, are you there, Dom? I'll let Julia go first this time, because uh, it's, <laughs> it's late, it's late for her. Yeah, I thought it might be. I think so. <laughs> no worries, I'm, I'm actually in, in Europe right now, so it's okay. It's early morning. So, but I, I love the discussion. I think it was, it was great to hear all the different perspectives from the, the developers. And I think what, you know, there are a couple of themes that I heard, you know, the scaling challenges are really, you know, they're, they're global. And, and I think what we're seeing with just the global supply chain interferences, it's, it's causing a lot of different discussions. And so I think the benefit of, as mentioned earlier, having these conversations, sharing the lessons learned, sharing, you know, the fact that, that we're all working on this together, that there is huge opportunity kind of really help de-risk a lot of the conversations and just the what you know just the industry itself so i think the value add we can de-risk we can scale up and i think there's enormous um benefit to all of our associations working together to provide the knowledge and, and just the the platform to to make sure that we have this market that is consistent across all our different countries and venues and that we can actually um really make this come to fruition and in the, the, the near term. I mean, 2050 is too far. So we've, we've got to really push this to be now. Thanks very much. Yep. And, um, and, yeah, and from my perspective, um, you know, I, a very smart person who's, who's actually on this told me that, you know, to, to a certain degree, it's about the coalition of the willing. I mean, you know, we've got companies who develop very good technologies um, to do things, but but to me, I think I think we just need to create the market. So I think we need to collaborate, work together. I mean, I actually works with 1414, MGA, Graphite Energy, 
um, you know, we're, we're, we're Glacium have, have recently, and so it's just about trying to bring people on board to, to really help to, to create an awareness and understanding and then create that market. And once the market's created, then everyone can go off and compete. There's enough work out there. But, but to me, I really do think that it's really important to sort of get that market uh, up and running and to work together with the technology developers and some of the big, big entities. You know, we've, we've done a lot of work with Mars and, and, and others around trying to create awareness and understanding. And I think it just does take that sort of trust and working together to, to create the market, to get it going. And, um, you know, that's what happened with PV and batteries. And, and I think it will happen with renewable heat as well. So, so you know, my view is that, you know, reach out, you know, we, 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 we try to be technology agnostic, but really ha happy to, to, to put companies and technology develops together to develop optimal solutions. Um, and, and it's not about picking winners, it's just about getting the right things done in the right locations for the right reasons. But we do need to, to collaborate, I think, initially to create that market. Yeah, no, an interesting point. And it, it comes back to this complexity again, everyone's grappling with it and, you know, you have your own, um, Sort of site complexities, um, organisational complexities in terms of capital availability, and then sort of the technical optimization and hybridization complexity. So it's a call coming in. Um, you know, what are some of the ways? Um, I don't know if um, Jared wants to comment on this again. How can we sort of um, take out some of the friction? Um, and you, I think you referred to something that the New Zealand uh, government's doing. But any other? suggestions or wishes from people how to, how to take out some of the friction because I always think if, it's gonna, if it takes five years to get a project done you know that's that's going to slow things down if you can get it done in two and a half um, obviously we can really help uh, decarbonize faster. I'll just go to knowledge sharing and what this what you guys are doing today just more and more of this and I do like the approach the likes of uh, Lion Group are taking here where they're not really looking to build IP on these uh, green projects that they're doing. Uh, they're willing to do them and, and, and get into them and then and then really share a lot. Uh, you know, pretty much very open book the way they're thinking uh, and, and share their knowledge on how to implement these solutions, especially with their suppliers to try and go after their scope three emissions. Um, the, the, the systems they're doing, the engineering style, the thinking there, they're being very open. So I think that not knowledge sharing, we don't have time to waste and, and we certainly can't wait uh, for three years for a major uh, region project to be installed and then have lessons learned and then wait for another three years. You know, this has got to be live and it's got to be on the go uh, uh, so that we, we, we're learning through the, the different project phases as well. Yeah, and I think to that point, Jared, and, you know, to the whole group and the people who are online as well, you know, the knowledge sharing team is really, you know, keen to support this transition and the industry as most effectively as we can. And so, we, you know, we will share a survey at the end of this. I'll, I'll put it in the chat, but we'll also follow up with that. And we're really open to your thoughts uh, and also just reaching out outside those surveys at any time to understand how we can best support you all. Just Jordan has got his hand up. So I will oh, just throw okay. Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I was just going to back it up to saying, yeah, I mean, I agree that, that in terms of knowledge sharing, between not just end users and technology developers, but you know, giving government and policy in there as part of it, you know, that, that awareness that uh, of you know, decarbonising heat is, I think, probably understand that at a technical aspect, but maybe not so much uh, in uh, other uh, arenas. Um, also, yeah, you know, the time scale, time scale to me is you know, we need we need to be more experiments uh, as such. You know, that we're, as uh, I think it might have been Thomas or Paul said earlier, there's it's, it's a decarbonisation means change. What, what, what that solution looks like, we're not 100% sure. So how do, how do we have, you know, try to fail fast to see what works, uh, what doesn't okay. uh, as quickly, you know, and facilitating that in a way that manages risk, which is especially around you know, for the, those high temperature end users that, or you know, the processes that are, need to be um, functioning. Uh, and just to, but also to reiterate a point that I made earlier about as another, another barrier is you know, a lot of what we're talking about is electrification. Uh, and so for early stage projects like ours, you know, the, the complexity cost or aspect of grid connection is you know, it's beyond us as a developer, but you know, it's, 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 it's a, there's, that can be as such a significant barrier to having a, a, a an experiment as well. So I just just raise that as another 
uh, potential action that, that can unlock uh, experiments. Dom, quick comment from you, and then I've got one more question. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to just reiterate that that most of the clients I work with, that they're just they're inundated with technology developers and solutions. Um, you know, you've got a solution to do this temperature, and you've got a solution to do that temperature, and you've got different technologies. And and so this honest broker, where what we do is just help companies to understand what their options, whether it's a region option, or whether it's an MGA, or whether it's a graphite energy, or whether it's fourteen fourteen. We just, we, we're helping them to understand what the temperature range is and what their options are. We don't pick winners. We just go, hey, these are the type of things you need to think about. Here are some integration challenges. Here's some high level techno-economics to just help them to sort out the noise and focus on the things that will probably make the biggest difference. And, and you know, we find, you know, all of our clients appreciate that service because we're not, we're not picking winners. We don't say it's CST. We don't say it's electricity. We just look at their profile. And I think there's something like that needed in this space that you, you just, you know, like, just to help people to understand what, what that option space looks like and, and what they need to think about and who they need to talk to. And we, we you know, it doesn't matter about Astrid, it doesn't matter who does it or Saro or Meva. It's the same thing that Jared does. Jared does the same thing, but for lower temperatures. And I just sort of think that honest broker helping industry to understand what's out there and, and, and what works and what doesn't for their needs is important because there's so much noise out there and they just get, oh my God, you know, should I be do, doing this or that? And and, you know, and, and, you know, anyway, I just find that, yeah. that we've been successful in that space. I agree, I agree with that, Tom. I've got a question from the audience around IP, which I think is an interesting one. I don't know who, I mean, I think Glacium might have some experience in this in terms of working with other partners and developing IP jointly. Um, I don't know if others have had that experience. What are some of the challenges that the technology companies have in terms of navigating the IP um, sort of minefield? Anybody want to have a go at that? Then I think uh, Andrew from Glacium has uh, okay. left. Okay, lost Andrew. Andrew. Anyone else? Well. Anyone else got any comments on IP? I know obviously investors always ask the question: What's your how patentable and protectable is your IP? Is is that a challenge that adds yet so another is, a complexity is problem? It, is that, I, mean, I, I think I'm just not not sure, 100 percent sure on the question. Is it about protecting IP as much as recognizing it? I think, I think there's a question around sort of joint IP, um, you know. And I guess when, when you're developing projects and you're working with various partners, there's a question about who's got what IP and you know how reliant you become on 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 on, on that IP. But to, me, to me, that's that's so far for us that that's been okay. I think the probably the barrier there is more around. We've talked about collaboration, sharing information, and 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 that being important to address and grow the market. So, so how do you foster a foster that while respecting everyone's IP and and protecting that too? That's probably the, I think the more more probably significant question in that. That, for example, Ford MD and MGA, we're, we're in some ways doing very similar things, but there's potential and graphite as well but, no, but, but there's probably some really good conversations we could have and learnings that we could um, benefit from that help us all as well as help end users too so how how do you enable that to happen while uh, still respecting IP but growing up but that that's that's the I think the more significant IP question um, or, or sorry aspect relating to IP that would have benefit for all parties involved here Peter, you've got your hand up. Yeah. And we might just I, go to wrap up. I think, uh, yeah, look, I think there's a really good example here. You know, Alex from MGA and, and Graphite Energy, you know, we are in a collaboration with Toshiba on the development of the solid oxide electrolysis system. Um, both of us are doing thermal energy storage components within the overall system. Uh, I think, you know, the key was actually not around the protection of the IP per se, but was just getting everybody... Um, you know, the table being willing to collaborate and being very clear on, you know, each of our roles made that, you know, parts of it made sense to share knowledge. And then other parts were, you know, clearly our respective IP bundles. But I think, you know, um, identifying, you know, the like-minded partners and, and kind of forming you know, cooperating with people that are uh, keen to collaborate was the was the key, and the the rest of it to some extent looked after itself. 
Um, but it, it's been a really, you know, the Toshiba thing um, that, you know, Alex and I are involved in is, you know, a really exciting opportunity. We're still towards the beginning kind of phase of that project, but, you know, already it, it, it's, it's um, bringing benefits in our broader business already. Okay, look, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers. I, I really enjoyed doing the, the moderating of the Q&A, um, but I'll hand back to Lisa um, to, to, to wrap us up and um, do any of the uh, final housekeeping, but thanks very much. And uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you, Dan. Um, and definitely thanks so much to all the speakers, um, the session facilitators, Dan and, uh, and Lim, and also definitely to all those who worked behind the scenes. This is really much appreciated. Um, I think we uh, we heard really great stories about you know the opportunities and the applications. We definitely heard something about challenges. Um, but also, as Peter just mentioned, I really had the kind of feeling that there is willingness to collaborate. And hopefully, um, I think we are kind of leaving the virtual room today uh, with a better understanding of how we can potentially overcome these challenges together. Um, so I, I think, generally speaking, we, um, of course, the speaker uh, shared interesting insights um, that could potentially be helpful for other events uh, potentially in this topic. Um, but what we would write, like to do, as Lee mentioned, is hearing from you in terms of your feedback. Um, just please feel free to get in touch if you have any ideas in terms of how we could do better next time, how, what you would like to see in the future, and any potential feedback you have. Um, if you want to have more information on thermal energy storage or um, you know what what we have in terms of knowledge sharing from from our funded project, um, feel free to go and have a look at the knowledge sharing back. Um, you are also more than welcome to sign in to our insights newsletter or the arena wire newsletter if you have not done already. Um, and then just noting that we'll publish uh, the presentations and the recording of the summit on our knowledge bank um, in the next few days, uh, hopefully next week. Um, I think Liam has shared uh, the link to the survey in the chat box and you should have received also an email in your inbox with the link uh, to the survey. So please feel free to jump in and uh, fill uh, this very quick survey. So I think that's all for me. If there is nothing else from um, anyone else, I might close it here so that we can have like five minutes back in the day. I, I know it's been a very long event, um, but hopefully it's been helpful for everyone. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, I really hope to have a chat with you all soon. Bye.